Okay. Thank you, Clark. Okay, um, so we now declare the meeting of the Health Committee open to the public and um, online. Can I welcome all of the members who are participating by video conferencing this morning? And uh, I'd like to remind members about the protocols regarding the use of electronic devices. So uh, we have received no apologies to date. Are members aware of any other apologies? No. Okay, then moving on. Moving on then to the draft minutes, members, I refer you there to the draft minutes of the meeting of the 18th of February, which is a tab 3.1. Are members content with those minutes? Yeah, members content, thank you. Okay, members, moving then straight on to our first substantive briefing this morning, which is part of our COVID-19 disease response. And this morning we are receiving a briefing from Patricia Donnelly on the, an update of the vaccination program. I refer you there, members, to papers of tab five of your pack, which includes copies of recent correspondence received by the committee regarding vaccination. Can I also draw members' attention to correspondence from the shielding community at tab 12.14 and to correspondence at tab 12.23 of your table papers? I can advise members of Patricia here to update the committee on the, the rollout of the vaccination program. Um, so Patricia is uh, scheduled to be with us for approximately 45 minutes there, um, but will be back as, as committed to come back to the committee on the 18th of March again to provide a further update. So I'd now like to welcome by video link, Ms. Patricia Donnelly, who is head of COVID-19, the COVID-19 vaccination program. Good morning, Patricia. Are you able to hear us okay? I'm hearing you very well, Chair. Um, and I very much welcome the opportunity to update members um, on the progress of the... OK, well, listen, Patricia, we're, we're absolutely looking forward to, uh, to, to your update and to your engagement. I have to say we, we, uh, we really welcome the fact that you have agreed to engage with the committee, but also to note that I think we all agree that the, the vaccination programme is a huge undertaking in the, in the first instance and, and has been going very well. I think we all recognise there have been issues, but that would be, I suppose, given the size and the scale and the complexity of the programme, um, those issues are to be expected. And I think that engaging um, the work you're doing and, and the engagement with the community is all, is all useful in terms, of, in terms of streamlining that. And I do know that there were, there were things, commitments made in the last meeting and, and delivered upon and, and that those did help to address some of the concerns. And then this is an opportunity, I suppose, for members to flag to you concerns they're picking up on the ground or ideas or advice. So uh, really want to really want to welcome you this morning. And maybe are you are you going to give us a bit of a briefing or an update and then we can move into a bit of question and answer, Patricia? Yes, uh, I thought that it would be helpful just to confine my remarks to just a few brief uh, updates because uh, as uh, on the last occasion, I thought the questions were incredibly helpful for me to identify areas that I needed to target and to become aware and to give assurances around those. So I'll keep my update very brief. There's a lot that's okay. already in the public domain that committee members will uh, be aware of. Um, uh, we've now reached a landmark. Uh, we've over uh, 509,000 uh, doses of the um, vaccine administered. Uh, we very shortly in the next day or two will ha have that up to uh, 500,000 uh, individuals who've been protected by the vaccine. And, and uh, uh, like me, I'm sure you feel very reassured by that. However, challenges, as always, along the way. Um, I'm very happy to say that a high percentage of our older adults, over 65 years and above, have been vaccinated. In the over 80-year-olds, it's 95%, and there's very few left. A, a few that are, may be housebound still, a few that are in hospital will be vaccinated in the coming days if they haven't been vaccinated already. Um, some of our more difficult and challenging areas have been around the clinically extremely vulnerable and encouraging them to come forward. We've had a steady bookings with that and uh, between general practice and the trust vaccination centres, we've now vaccinated over 54,000 of those within that uh, category. Um, and equally, we've been uh, commenced on our category six. So we're right down uh, through those five uh, top six priority groups. And we're now at priority group six, which uh, will include the uh, both uh, the clinically vulnerable that the GPs are calling forward and carers. Um, and I suppose carers has been 
a, a group that I've been um, concerned about and a group that I've really taken some time and attention to focus on. I've met with uh, carers organisations, the carers coalition, and looked at, at what would be a reasonable approach um, to calling this group forward. We already know that 25,000 are vaccinated every year with the winter flu vaccine program with general practice. Um, but what the carers groups told us is that there are many others that um, are not easy to identify, but are the main carers for vulnerable individuals without whom the care would fail. Um, and they said to us, well, there may be a number that in receipt of uh, carers allowance, but in fact, they get an annual letter which gives them an indication of uplift, but it isn't retained by everyone. So people, even with carers allowance, don't find it easy to um, evidence uh, that they are a carer. Um, they also said that um, to make it as easy as possible for carers, that we should have an open call out and they would also through their organisations call out. So we did that and I'm happy to say that we had um, over 54,000 people come forward uh, in within a few days. Now we became aware in the final days of that um, that others were becoming aware that this was quite easy to access. So um, they'd used up all the available um, slots. So before we put additional slots into the um, onto the vaccination centres, we went back to the carers uh, coalition again and said, how do you think we should address this? Because they were very concerned that the misuse of that was, was not carers, but they believed were others inappropriately accessing the vaccination programme. So we agreed with them that we'd continue with the, the call out through general practice and that what we would do is through the carer organisations and the trust carer coordinators that we would ask people to contact them and we would book them onto the vaccination uh, uh, booking platform and that allowed them to access it safely and not and those slots not to be taken by others inappropriately so we've now created that capacity we've set up that connection we've advertised those links so we hope that we can bring carers forward so that's where we are at the moment what we're going to do next uh, chair and members is um, during March we hope to have a lot more um, vaccine so we're going to really ramp up the uh, program through March and we're in the active planning stage for that. You'll be aware that the next three priority groups are all age related. So priority group seven is the over 60s, um, uh, priority group eight is the over 55s and then and priority group nine uh, will be the 50s and above. So we, as part of that, have uh, commissioned a piece of work to open a large mass vaccination centre on the SSE arena, and we hope that that will open towards the end of March. We'll also be in developing plans with community pharmacy uh, to have local access with, and access will continue through general practice. So again, you'll see we're trying to do this as quickly as the vaccine is available, and uh, we expect there'll be bumps as always, but when we hear about them, if we can solve them or work with others to solve them, we're very happy to do so. So happy to take any detailed questions. Um, I know that, uh, that members are very interested and, uh, and I very much welcome that interest and support. Okay, thank you, Patricia. You you are breaking up on my end here, slight bit, but it's oh. not enough to interrupt. It's not enough to interrupt. Uh, but it's just it's just something to be aware of. If it got worse, we might need to. But um, I'm not sure. Maybe it's my head, headset or or yours. But I'm hoping members were able to follow. Okay, I, I certainly was. Okay, I suppose my first one is just picking up on that on that day. Uh, significant issue around around cures and i know that there has been some concern around the uh, around the withdrawal of the system online and i think i think that needs to be communicated out to cures as effectively as possible to reassure them there also had there were in in the initial days but i'm not sure if maybe it has been addressed or if it was isolated but there had been some significant reports of gps kind of not really understanding that that cures were now part of the system so i'm not sure if there was a communication issue there however the main the main one i suppose that i want to focus on this morning given what given what you have said is around the issue of identifying in, in fact the the, the well acknowledged issue of cures self identifying in the first instance is really a problem and always is a problem for cures and for delivering support to cures and for them seeking support 
Now, I'm aware that at times there have been very useful pilots done, I think, in the Northern Trust area with community pharmacy, where they would proactively ask people who they would see in on a regular basis, maybe collecting medicines or whatever, are you are you a cure? This is pre-COVID. Are you a cure? They would then be able, when, when they got that conversation going and identified people, they were then able to divert them towards or signpost them towards services. And that was that was quite effective. I think it was particularly effective among older men who didn't see their role as being a cure. They were just doing what they always did. So have you any plans to try to proactively encourage cures to recognize that they're, they're in a cure in role and to come forward through the, the revised system that you have in place? Well, I think, uh, thank you very much for that. I think we've, with our work with the Carers Coalition, which is the overarching body, I think, with a lot of carers groups, we've been taking their advice and they certainly communicate that out and they try to ensure that uh, carers can self-identify. I think to reassure you, what we know is that through the age cohorts, um, we're vaccinating a lot of people who are they're vaccinated in their own right because of their age, but there are also carers. Um, and uh, because what the carers uh, groups have told us that the majority of carers, the vast majority of carers are age 50 and above. So, um, and it probably it pretty much matches the description that you've given around the experience of, of uh, carers going into local pharmacies. We are working with GPs on this. We're working with the GP leadership. Um, GPs are only starting to move down into the carers group now because they've been also vaccinating the vulnerable and the clinically extremely vulnerable as well as some, as some older adults. Um, and they will do that uh, more quickly once they have more vaccine available. They've had a steady stream, but not really enough to have vaccinated everyone that they would wish to do so. So we will look to those ideas. We are um, planning to engage with, uh, we've already been engaging with community pharmacy, but we are planning a program that will more directly involve community pharmacy. So we've got many ways to try and capture the same, um, uh, to cope with, sorry, cope with the same challenges. But I recognise everything that you say because that fits with what the carers have told us. Um, and it isn't about finding one single way. I think we have to find multiple ways uh, to, to do this and to make sure that people, when they're providing that critical care without which an individual's um, placement or care would fail, um, they may not recognise that they're in that critical role. And, and the carers groups have said, this is a long-standing problem, that there is a, a wider issue here that we're tapping into. And uh, and we hope even through this, there might be a secondary benefit that it, that it does bring this issue forward. And it does mean that we connect people up with some of the support infrastructure uh available to them yeah yeah and I, I, yeah and I, I agree there is a more a more systemic problem there that, that does need to be addressed in order to try to like some estimates would would uh, put the cures here at around about three hundred thousand. so obviously the fifty four thousand that you have identified is very welcome but there's quite a gap between those two so anyway hopefully that is one of the things that will emerge from, from COVID is that we recognize the key role of cures we find a way to identify them to to register them and to have a system of support and communication in place with them in the event that things like this happen i think that's one of the key things that we could usefully learn going forward thank you for that patricia the other issue is then i, I want to also welcome the fact that you very quickly yesterday uh, moved to um bring in the learning disability adults into into the program in recognition of, of how much more vulnerable and susceptible they can be so so that was welcome and in light of then your remarks about about having additional supply in march i would like to focus then on the plan at this point or, or the priority being given or how you can look at a public a frontline workers, workers who are out in the front line, public transport workers, workers in meat plants and places like that where we know there are specific issues around transmission and uh, enhanced transmission, if you like, in those very critical sectors of our of our supply chains. So are there are there plans in place or what's your what's your thoughts or have you anything you can update us on in relation to protection of frontline workers? Uh, well, Chair, you'll know that uh, the Joint Committee for Vaccination and Immunisation set the policy on this, and so far they focused on those priority groups one to nine. Uh, that was mainly on the basis of mortality and morbidity and who was most likely to die or most likely to be affected. They have, I understand, 
um, been debating the issue of essential workers and the next cohort after category group nine. So because we've still working through all the, the, the four nations are still working through the categories one to nine, we expect that JCVI, which is the Joint Committee, uh, will report in the next week or two about their debate and their advice on those essential workers. And I'm sure they'll take all those considerations into account. But I, I would want to assure people that I think that by the time we finish category group nine, um, down to the over 50 year olds, you've captured a significant part of the population. We will have uh, seven, eight hundred thousand of the population, not covering all of those groups, but covering some of those most vulnerable within those groups. Um, uh, in the same way that many of the carers will already have been captured, uh, not just through our, our dedicated um, appeal to them, but through the age uh, cohorts. Okay. So I don't okay. have anything. Thank apologies, you. I don't have anything definitive today. But once I get something definitive, we'll we'll turn our minds and uh, and deliver whatever is expected of us. Okay, okay, thank you. Appreciate that. Okay, I'm going to go then to members. So I'm going to go first of all to our deputy chair there, Pam Cameron. Um, Pam, go ahead, please. Thank you, chair, and um, Patricia. Um, a huge thank you to you once again. Uh, thank you for being here this morning. I know you are incredibly busy, and I wanted to uh, just uh, on the outset thank you and your entire team, right down to every single member of this vaccine rollout program. I think it is really important that all trust and GP staff are thanked for what is a tireless effort to provide this um, protection. Um, I've also been contacted by many individuals who have asked me to pass on their thanks for the good experience that they've had in accessing easily and receiving their vaccine. Uh, slick operation and efficient are words that spring to mind um, uh, in that commentary. And I know there is some concern around um, abuse of the opening up of the vaccine slots to carers, but I think it is also important um, that recognition is there that carers often don't have access to formal documentation, which proves their caring status. Uh, but I do think this the whole subject highlights again the need for um, staff working in the special educational needs sectors as well, who are arguably carers to have a similar priority. Um, so I have a few questions for you, Patricia, um, and I wanted to kick off with if you have any figures around what percentage of the special educational needs sector have been vaccinated, um, including special um, needs school staff. And I wanted to ask you as well, if you, uh, you've talked about the vaccine supply and opening up new slots and stuff, and that's great. Um, but can you tell us when exactly you expect to receive the next um, supply of vaccine for the vaccine centres? And when do you expect those additional slots for carers to open up, albeit I understand? And I thank you for your communication as well this morning on um, uh, to advise how those slots can be um, accessed. And, uh, and I know... Uh, I and other members of the committee will will do our best to share that information out to the public as well to help uh, to help you on that. So that's initial, and then I have a couple more if you don't mind. Uh, thank you very much. Very happy to answer your questions. Um, there's been a very careful process undertaken around identifying uh, those children where. Um, uh, within the special school sector where those who are working with them would need to be vaccinated. I understand that's underway rather than complete, um, but some of those staff, because of their age, may well have been vaccinated or if they've underlying health conditions. Um, so I wouldn't have detailed figures at the moment for how many would be vaccinated, nor do I expect that um, many of the, the others that have subsequently been identified have actually come forward for vaccination yet. But as soon as that work is complete, um, they'll, they'll get immediate access to the vaccination centres to be vaccinated. Um, our vaccine supply has been very steady. We do get weekly deliveries, both of AstraZeneca and of Pfizer. Uh, it has been very reassuring that what we're predicted to get, we do get. So I think we would have had a very 
an easy sense at the beginning that when you get something that's indicative it's a new vaccine you're never absolutely sure that you'll get it exactly as planned but our experience has been very reassuring uh, and we've now been told that all the recent work that was done um, uh, on the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine that um, to ramp up their production that we will get more in March so we do expect that probably from the second week in March we will have higher volumes that increase through that month um, and into April so that that allows us to plan for that increase so that we can ramp up our capacity. Okay, that's that's great. That's very useful and very um, comforting to hear that those supplies are are, are steady and um, coming as predicted. So that's great. Um, I wanted to ask you as well, Patricia, around uh, the clinically extremely vulnerable. Um, there was uh, figures put out last night or yesterday around how many of each. Um, priority group had been vaccinated and I was kind of taken aback by the low number or on the CEV side of things it was I think it was in around 36,000 something like that um, and of course we're aware that um, the shielding letters that went out reached over the 200,000 mark I'm just concerned that there seems to be a, a huge gap and I understand that some of those CEV people may, may well be covered under the age groups um, it, is, can you give us an, an explanation as to, to why that CEV figure um, vaccinated is so low compared to the number of shading letters that have been distributed? Well, we by no means uh, completed this EV group. Um, what our trust colleagues will tell us is that when invited, some of them are very slow to come forward. I know within my own family, we have a, a younger member who is a very unwell with um, a very complex cancer. And I know that she found it very difficult to come forward. Um, you know, having shielded for a year, you don't feel necessarily safe going out. You may not feel very well. So what I've been advised is that it takes longer. So we've got a still a steady number of individuals coming forward and we understand that they may, may need to kind of think things through they may need encouragement and confidence to do that so that is definitely part of the issue um, but I do think they are double counted in some other areas uh, we know there was a high number of the shielding letters sent out um, and uh, some individuals, as I said, will be within the CEV group and may well be in the clinically vulnerable. So GPs are working their way through that. We also know some of them don't necessarily want to come to a trust centre. They would find the local accessibility through general practice to be more reassuring or, or um, uh, easier for them to manage. Um, so we, I, I think this is a group that probably quite steadily over time will just continue to see come forward and uh, we're going to do a sort of reconciliation um, as we go along to see if there's anything specific that it, additionally that we need to do um, to get individuals to come forward and it may be that some of them will remain housebound so we do have district nursing going out to individuals homes and they've already vaccinated uh, over 5,000 we know that there's more that they will be vaccinating so when we become aware of them we'll also uh, make sure that they are not lost or not forgotten that thank you and i was going to i was going to mention district nursing because it strikes me that um if there's um issues around illness and uh even confidence and fear for those who have been shielding for so long that really i think it would be would be appropriate to um to kind of bulk up that district nursing service if at all possible and and allow those individuals to, to receive their vaccine in their own homes if that if that is helpful i think that should be done um i, I wanted to ask you as well then around um flexibility um in the vaccination centers and also by gps and using any additional um vaccine that's left in in the vials we know that they're they are overfilled which is great um, it could, so could you tell us a bit more about what flexibility there is in terms of not having to stick so strictly to the uh, JCVI list um, for the vaccination centres at the end of the day or before um, the vaccines are, are going to run out of time and also for, for GPs as well? Uh, yes, thank you. A, a, a quite an astute question in terms of uh, what we knew about the vaccine. They would come on a certain vial dose and we now know we can get an extra dose out of both the Pfizer vaccine and the AstraZeneca vaccine. With the Pfizer vaccine, we needed to wait 
permission to use that additional dose, which has now been uh, granted by MHRA. And uh, now uh, vaccine centres plan to use it. So when they're calculating what they need to do in a day, they've actually calculated that additional dose in, which is very helpful. Um, and uh, and within the vaccine centre, that means they calculate that out much more accurately. So it is very rare that they would have additionality. That they would need to be finding someone uh, to vaccinate. But because there's a very short uh, shelf life to the very large pack size, they know at the end of a four day run that they're likely to have some. So they usually have people on standby and that will be either to go and call staff in for a second dose to get that completed or they'll find staff that will not have been vaccinated. So um, it, it's 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 quite easy within that that, that group. Um, in general practice, it's a little bit different because they're using the AstraZeneca, the Oxford AstraZeneca uh, vaccine, and um, it was some time before there was approval to use that additional dose that was in the ten dose file or the eight dose file. Um, and uh, and GPs, I've heard descriptions of where GPs have said, I know that there is a housebound patient just across the way, and they've gone in and used that. So they're also starting to adapt to the fact that they know that they, at the end of a, of a day, um, they may have some additional vaccine. Um, they have been contacting individuals, and they certainly have the discretion uh, to do that. We have encouraged them however to try and keep to the prioritization as much as possible quite clearly that's not always the case and uh, but it has been my experience that gps do use their discretion very wisely they, they're also people who may not tightly fit the definitions that we've given them but they're people that they're clinically they're concerned about so um, and they do have that discretion uh, to vaccinate in that way um, and uh, and occasionally, I think I'm sure you hear and I hear uh, stories where individuals who are in no priority group get vaccinated, and you know uh, th sometimes that can call a lot cause a lot of unease to other people who are waiting uh, for the vaccine. However, I do think the waste of the vaccine becomes a greater issue than than um, than uh, not using it. So. Uh, I, I think where there's no other option, you just do vaccinate, and, and I think uh, um, GPs have been using that discretion. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Pam. Um, um, so we need to then I'm going, I'm, I'm going to end very, very briefly, Pam. You've had quite a time now. Yeah, it was just Brief to say comment, that, Pam. thank you, Patricia. Yes, just say thank you, Patricia, um, and that I completely agree with you. I think that the most important thing that the vaccine is not wasted. So thank you very much. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Pam. Okay, so at this point, I have Orlea, Carol, Chiara, Paula, and Jerry. So I'm going to go firstly then to Orlea Flynn. Go ahead, Orlea. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, thank you, Patricia. Maybe just quickly to follow on from Pam's last point there around. Um, that's really good to hear that obviously you're trying to maximise all of the vaccine that we'll have and reduce the levels of wastage. I'm just wondering, Patricia, I know we've heard previously that up until now the, the levels of wastage have been extremely low. Is that still the case? It is, it, it is still the case. And in fact, what's been very helpful, because what I would have previously reported included supply wastage, and that might mean where... Um, uh, a vial was dropped and couldn't be used or that there was something wrong with it and the quality and it couldn't be used. Uh, now, that, that is rare, but actually, the, truly, the waste is even rarer. Uh, everybody treats this as, as very precious and they look at every dose and who might have it. So we do find it's, it's very, very low. It's well below 1%, uh, which I think is remarkable for any vaccination program. That's brilliant, Patricia. Thanks very much. And then um, just on the issue, so um, I'm glad to hear you are hoping then that you have received that further stock um, in the first or second week of March and that that will then um, include the vaccinations of the 50, anyone aged 50 plus. Um, and I'm just wondering if you're aiming then towards the end of March to um, open up the new centre at the Odyssey, uh, could you maybe elaborate a wee bit more on the logistics of this? So, you know, is all the plan in place if the stock arrives in March, then, you know, the, the Odyssey, for uh, by way of example, will be ready to go um, to try and start that sort of broader mass uh, vaccination? Uh, well, we've had 
fantastic cooperation. It's been led by Southeastern Trust and Belfast Trust working together because, as you know, they've got two very successful uh, vaccination centres that are part of the SLIC uh, operation that I think you've heard some uh, feedback on. Um, and uh, they, working with the Public Health Agency, have been looking at the model for the vaccination, the, uh, the number of stations that they need. So even if we didn't get all of the vaccine that we expect, uh, we will still open it because we can still have enough vaccine to open that additional centre. And the plan is then that we would um, collapse the two um, hospital based uh, centres at the Royal and the Ulster into the Odyssey because together they can do far more than the two centres will do independently. So um, we are looking at uh, potentially very large numbers going through there. Um, it's, a, it's practically a military operation in terms of setting up all the stations, ensuring the car parking, ensuring the, all the medicines governance around the control of the vaccine, uh, been able to get people in and out in a socially distanced way. So all of it has been thought through incredibly carefully, but also the experience of those two trusts um, in running very successful centres, they know what works, they know you, how you need to organise that. So they, in the coming weeks, will will go into the centre and lay it out in exactly the way that it needs to go. And the advantage is that we will be using the Oxford AstraZeneca um, vaccine largely there for first doses and it's one where people don't have to stay for a 15 minute observation you know it's a it's a much easier vaccine so we will be able to kind of speed through much more quickly um in that large center than we had to do using pfizer in the other centers and just finally very quickly chair because i want to give time to the other members so if the hope is that that process will start at the end of march do you have um, what would be the proposed finish date for that? Where then you're going into the next phase of the any one over eighteen? Well, uh, I would hope quite quickly. Uh, I think it will be uh, now. Uh, that's pending the JCV advice. The the joint committee will give us advice. They may tell us to go down age cohorts. They may tell us to just do an open thing. They may tell us about essential workers. They may tell us to target. So in a way, we just have to be flexible enough that we can pivot to whatever requirements there are, and we can in such a large centre as well. We can stream. Um, different individuals but we still have the other vaccination centres elsewhere and we will be having that local access through community pharmacy and general practice so it's not that you rely on one thing you have to do a number of things because they all suit different people and different lifestyles and different preferences so we need to make sure we accommodate all of those things thank you Thank you. Okay, thank you, Arlea. And going then to Carol. Carol and Nicolin. Go ahead, Carol. And thank you, Patricia. Um, I think you are doing a really good job under very difficult circumstances. So I just want to put that on the record. Um, Patricia, I just want to ask a question about the definition of vulnerable children. Um, I don't know if you've seen the Children's Law Centre's concerns around you know, children who are on known to social services but haven't been allocated a social worker yet. And then even some of the vulnerable children who are actually carers. You'll you'll be quite aware that there's a, a large cohort of young people who are carers. And it's just to try and get a bit more information on that. Um like just just to give you a, a very small example, that some of the anecdotal information we're getting is that a lot of children who are being looked after in foster care have been unfortunately moved a bit, moved about a bit more than what would have been anticipated because some of their cars have either contracted COVID or cl are clinically vulnerable. So those children, if you could just even, um, you know, give me some information on that. And then just to, just to kind of finish off on the special educational needs school. Um, so. It is really welcomed um, around children with learning disabilities. The announcement's been made, but it's a whole, as you said, it's a whole school community that we need to look at because it very much is a community. So could you give me any more information on that, Patricia? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I've tried to go through and try to make a wee note of your questions as, as we've gone along. 
Um, when we are um, looking at vulnerable children, and therefore those who come within the definition, it's clinically vulnerable. So in fact, I recognise that there's psychological and social vulnerability. However, in terms of vaccination, uh, the, the priority for um, those being vaccinated are those young people, because these these vaccines are not licensed. Um, uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine is not licensed uh, below 18 years of age and Pfizer is not licensed below 16 years of age. So we've had to put in place arrangements for clinically vulnerable uh, children um, that are known to general practice uh, to be vaccinated in the, t uh, the trust vaccination centres. So that process is underway at the moment. Um, and we've got no advice yet about vaccinating any vulnerable children under that age. However, um, you know, there are now many millions of um, others and young people and adults have been vaccinated now. So I do think that people will keep this under review and we may well get revised advice, but I don't expect that until later in the year. So there'll be no specific vaccine for uh, children. Um, however, um, we already have a, a, a program within trusts that foster carers that were providing care for looked after children, that uh, they were offered vac vaccine for all the reasons that you state that the risk of the breakdown of that placement is significant for um, for a child in those circumstances. So we did that as soon as we were able to do, and that probably happened mainly during January. Um, and that offer was still open to anyone who had, had been made that offer and didn't feel at the time able to take that up. Um, and again, the um, if I come to the learning disability, uh, we already have vaccinated quite a number of those within the learning disability community because those who live in a community such as a care home or um, supported living or attend day centres would be at high, slightly higher risk because they're much more exposed to other people uh, as opposed to someone who shields, who is protected. Um, so trusts had already been vaccinating those individuals and uh, and were very keen to vaccinate all, all others. So in fact, the JCVI recent advice, we were ready and, and very active in, in calling the individuals forward. Um, with the special educational needs, again, it will look at the clinical vulnerability. So there are those, particularly those with neuro disabilities that have um, need a number of procedures where they um, um, where there will be aerosol generating and therefore a higher risk to those who are actively engaged in caring for them and it's those individuals that that uh, will need to be protected and it's those individuals that some of whom have already been vaccinated and others that will be in the process have been called forward um, so it's uh, at the moment um, it, all of the program is targeted at risk, those most at risk. And once you've dealt with those most at risk, you kind of move more confidently down through uh, those others who are also at risk and uh, until we can get down to the general population. So this part has been careful and a bit slow and a bit frustrating for people. And that's why you've heard me many times where we call out for people to be patient. And I'm aware of the kind of anxiety that ind individuals have as they wait to be vaccinated or they want their loved ones, the people they care for to be vaccinated. But um, we will do it as quickly as we possibly can. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Richard, thank you, Claire. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. And uh, going then, so I'm going next to Kiara Hunter. I then have Paula, Jerry, and Alan indicating in that order. So I'm going now to Kiara. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Chair. And thank you, Patricia, uh, being here today. I know your time is very precious, so we're very grateful to have you. I just have a few questions. I'm mindful of time. Um, my first one is around, um, recently I spoke with an individual who was vaccinated in Belfast, and they had said following their vaccine, there was very limited information around the potential to still pass on COVID-19 to others. Um, so my question is, what with follow-up, is there anything more that can be done, perhaps like a booklet, or is there any campaign around this? But um, in addition to that, is there any kind of consideration or something similar to like a helpline people can ring around vaccination to get answers and clarification? Uh, thank you very much. An interesting angle. I, I, I don't know if you can see me today, but I'm wearing a badge. And the badge is about social distancing, and it's been handed out now in the vaccination centres for some of the very reasons that you're saying. Um, it's very—I uh, got it because I've. 
been recently vaccinated. Um, and uh, one of the issues is that um, people think that once they're vaccinated, that means they can't pass on. Now, uh, we're waiting for the um, emerging science on this because there may be some protection, but we don't yet know that. So people have to assume that they can pass it on, um, although um, they individually may well be resistant to have a higher immunity to getting uh, COVID-19 or indeed if they are unfortunate enough to get it to become seriously unwell. Um, but uh, I think for the very reasons that you're saying, there's increased messaging around this. Uh, there's posters in the vaccination centres and at general practice, and there's badges to remind people to take, continue to take those measures. Um, I think helplines are, are more difficult, given that we've got a lot of people overstretched on a number of kind of helplines and booking lines at the moment. So I think that getting uh, public information out onto um, onto uh, online and through social media, etc., are probably more powerful ways. Um, but we can certainly look at that again and see what we have to do to ramp that up, because I, I do think that that uh, can be a potential issue if we don't tackle it. Thank you, Patricia. Um, my next question refers to something I had raised with the minister previously around COVID-19 testing staff. Um, and given the nature of their work being frontline, um, I'm just curious if you could update us uh, on the committee around if they're being considered for the vaccine. Yes, we got recent advice that uh, they would be eligible for the vaccine. Uh, as you know, um, it, it doesn't really matter for the vaccination program what our personal views are about this and and uh, whether um, individuals are, um, you know, um, valuable and important or need to be called forward for the, the program. But I think that's a, a recent direction. So we are in the process of, of uh, vaccinating them. Great. That's great news. I know there was a lot of concern, so that's great to hear. Um, lastly, one question is around travel. I had recently spoken um, with a family where um, a father is taking care um, of a vulnerable child. Um, and I'm just curious, they had to travel from Armagh um, to get a COVID-19 uh, vaccination appointment in Derry. I'm just curious, is this something you've identified that seems to be an issue where people have to travel far to receive a vaccine? Uh, we have an open booking platform. So if people did that, they would go on and they would choose one of the seven vaccination centres. So sometimes people choose a date that suits them and maybe a venue that doesn't. Um, but what I need to assure people is that there will also be um, a vaccine available through GPs. So for some people where it's entirely unsuitable for them to travel, their GPs will be able to vaccinate them if they already know of them and would have vaccinated them in, in previous years. So there is a degree of choice about what people, where people go um, uh, because uh, probably the South Lakes would have been the near vaccination centre for someone living in Armagh. But uh, again, sometimes people have preferences around dates. That's great, Patricia. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Cara. And going then to Paula. Go ahead, Paula, please. Um, good morning, and thank you very much, Patricia, for being here this morning. Um, my first question relates to some conditions where there's a lack of clarity, confusion as to where they sit. And I'm talking about asthma, dementia, Parkinson's, ME, other neurological conditions. I appreciate some of them may be picked up in the age cohorts, but could you please speak to the those that would still be in, in the lower age groups? Thank you. First question. Okay, uh, thank you. We get uh, quite detailed advice from JCVI, and then we work with public health agency and others, um, the the advisors in the department, the medical advisors, around operationalising those uh, details. I mean, I think it's not a blanket. If you say a condition like asthma, some some people with asthma and very fragile asthma would have other complicating factors would have been in category group four there are others that i think we've been given guidance that if you have an inhaler and you get prescriptions um i think more than uh, three times and, and please forgive me i'm i'm paraphrasing what's very delicate careful advice um more than uh, three times over a two-year period you then fall into category group six but if you have a stable asthma that doesn't need much treatment you may not fall into any of those groups however what we have said to, to gps is their best place to assess the uh, clinical vulnerability, therefore their best place to identify. So while they have been given that general guidance around all of these conditions, um, I think that um, 
uh, they will vaccinate, I think, appropriately. And some will already have been vaccinated um, through the trust uh, programs as well. And uh, uh, I, I think many of those with, again, dementia will have been vaccinated as part of an age cohort, uh, and uh, but not necessarily through that. And, and it's the same we get for all of those groups. There's ongoing discussion, I, I think, around the ME groups. Um, as you know, it's a very wide uh, spectrum. So it's be, and I think it's because of those other conditions where there's a wide spectrum that some careful thought has to be given into when people fall into one cohort into another, or indeed just into a general age cohort. But um, most of those would be vaccinated through general practice, and as I said, usually in a very good position to judge the clinical frailty of the individuals. Okay, thank you. Um, my second question is around the under 18s. You've given some detail there around licensing for them, but I I've been contacted by a constituent whose daughter is just under 16. And the last time you came to committee, you said that the clinicians, I, sorry, not to want to put words in your mouth, but I think you said that clinicians can use their own professional judgment if they feel that they're particularly um, vulnerable and they can um, recommend. So I'm just wondering, are they given any guidance on that? And the second, in, in regard to that, again, another constituent, their son is Im immunosuppressed and needs Pfizer, but uh, their son is between 16 to 18 and the GP doesn't um, administer that dose. So how do they deal then with that sort of very fragile mid-teenage group? Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, in fact, we've met with GPs recently and what they've agreed and indeed suggested that uh, these um, uh, more fragile or more uh, clinically vulnerable 16 to 17 year olds, anyone from the age of 18 and over can get the Oxford AstraZeneca, but anyone who needs Pfizer who's 16 or 17, what they will do is they will write out to them and they'll give them the... the the portal for them and um, so they'll be able to go on and book their appointment so the process is underway so anyone who's in that position will be, be able to access the program very shortly if they haven't already done so we know that the some 16 to 17 year olds that are known to trust that are frequent hospital attenders will already have been vaccinated uh, through that um, uh, I, th I think it is quite difficult for those who are just under because we have a, a cut-off date um, that um, we want to err on the side of safety and caution given that this is not approved. So um, we want to look at carefully at any exceptional circumstances um, rather than to, to make this a, a, a blanket um, uh, recommendation. But we do know that, um, particularly for the Oxford AstraZeneca, there's a study underway, which we expect to report in the summer, about potentially vaccinating under that age group. And we very much welcome the output of that. So if anyone is concerned, uh, I think uh, eventually, I think there will, may well be a, a kind of solution uh, for them. But even where um, children have been immunocompromised, um, the, their outcomes are usually reasonably good. They are, they are less. Um, vulnerable uh, to this this particular virus, um, and uh, uh, and I think as long as we can make sure that carers are vaccinated, that you know that uh, we can protect, I think, a number of people in the in the family circle. Thank you. Very quickly, Chair, a very quick one just about the carers. You say that it's the main care, but um, I suppose it's very difficult to legislate for every family situation. But you know some. Like, just say the mother is the main care, but the father is in a frontline role. You know, is there, is there going to be provision for people, for the whole household, or even, as, as I think the chair mentioned there, even young carers, you know, who are out and about, maybe going to go back to school, and then they potentially bring the virus home to their clinically vulnerable younger brother and sister. So it's the household, as opposed to just the main care. Uh uh, thank you for that. I, I, our concern is that if we started to vaccinate whole households, I mean, I can see the, um, the attractiveness of, of doing it in that way. But if we did that, we'd very quickly consume the vaccine. So, um, I mean, and my concern about this, because this is category group six that we're talking about, is category group seven, eight and nine. Our trust colleagues tell us the people who are in hospital now are the over 50s, the people in ICU now are the over 50s. So I'm feeling a very strong imperative to make sure we get down and vaccinate that group. So um, while it sounds like a good idea to vaccinate whole households, in fact, that would be taking vaccine that we need to push on to that, um, those other priority groups. Thank you very much, Patricia. 
Okay, thank you for that. Um, and thank you, Paul and Patricia. I'm going then to Jerry. Go ahead, Jerry, please. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thanks, uh, Patricia. Um, Patricia, two questions, really. Uh, just in regards to people who are shielding, um, I have some correspondence this week uh, from people who are uh, CEV and people who have to shield, um, but they're getting pressured by their employer uh, to come back to work uh, because they've had a, a single dose. Um, can you confirm that uh, people shouldn't be uh, ending their shielding or, or shouldn't be returning to work, uh, as in leaving the house, uh, if they're uh, clinically extremely vulnerable or have to shield or have received a shielding letter until at the very least they've had um, two doses uh, of, of vaccine? Could, could you confirm that, please? I, I heard uh, CMO give an answer to this uh, very recently, and he said the guidance is very definitely that they continue to shield. Uh, we've, I, I suppose you've already heard me say today that uh, one one dose will give you a degree of immunity. However, you still it takes some time to build up, and it's not until you have your second dose and some time after that that you will have the greatest level of immunity. So. Um, I think the advice is if someone has been asked to shield, um, uh, it is not considered that one dose would be sufficient for them to override that advice. I yeah, appreciate that. And I think maybe I appreciate your answer and the CMO's answer um, the other day, but I think they need to do, put out a strong message from the department to ensure that employers aren't putting people uh, at risk because it's a, it's a very worrying, dangerous concern which puts people uh, um, at, at risk, uh, obviously. Uh, just, just a final question. Um, you were kind of saying the paraphrase, you're expecting a greater amount of vaccines coming in March time. Um, that's obviously a positive and, and, and a welcome development. Has there been any sort of uh, modeling or researching uh, comparing the, the amount of vaccines that will come in or likely to come in vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the likelihood of uh, easing restrictions uh, in April time, which is kind of hasn't been confirmed, which is the suggested, you know, uh, direction of travel, if you read between the lines and read certain journalists or whatever. Um, so how does that fit against, you know, unexpected uh, lifting of restrictions at, at some level in April, uh, and will uh, the increased number of vaccines coming in in March meet the, the sort of the the uh, the need, so to speak, with uh, with pe more people moving about freely and so on and so forth? Thanks, Jerry. I fully appreciate your question. Well above my pay grade to answer that. Uh, uh, I think all I can say is that. Um, we are pushing through as fast as possible on the vaccine programme, not just for the protection of the individuals, but we realise that it does have an impact on all of those other things, but it is only part of the picture. Uh, so I wouldn't really be able to comment on that wider picture, uh, but just to say that we will push very hard uh, through uh, the later stages of March and into April to get it deployed as quickly as possible and hope that it has a beneficial effect on the, the level of transmission and the, and the level of ill health, uh, but I think you can imagine there's many others who have other wider considerations that can comment on that Thank you. question. Thank you, Jay. And moving then to Alan. Go ahead, Alan. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Patricia, I think it's easy for us all to forget the, the sheer logistical scale of a, a mass vaccination programme, and it, it, it's certainly been new territory for not only the health authorities, but the, also the public at large. Um, there have been hiccups. I think that is inevitable, but I think that you have moved quickly to sort out these problems that have arisen, and I certainly congratulate you for that. Uh, the message, I think, is that there's, there, there's, there's no plan to exclude anyone from receiving the vaccine, and people do need to be patient. I think you said that earlier. And I think generally the public have been uh, brilliant uh, around this. But um, just to confirm, Pam asked you a question earlier about what did GPs do with the additional vaccine that they maybe have left at the end of a, a session. And uh, I can confirm uh, just from personal experience, and uh, I suppose we use a, a football term or two, that uh, the GPs are certainly on the ball. But um, I, got a, uh, I got a phone call on a Saturday afternoon um, at about 2.30, uh, to see if I'd be available to come down between three o'clock and half three to get the vaccine. So they must have a they must have a subs bench, as it were. Uh, but unfortunately, I wasn't able to uh, to respond as quickly as that. And I thought, my goodness, that time I go to the back of the list. But in fact, I got a phone call on Monday morning 
and was called down on Wednesday and got my vaccine on Wednesday. So, yeah, certainly the, the GPs are working hard to ensure that uh, there's nothing ending up in the, uh, in the waste bin. So, just Patricia, I'd like to thank you and your entire team for your efforts to date and keep the good work up. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for those comments. Uh, can I also say that uh, the many reports I get, and I've witnessed it myself, of individuals who get the vaccine and are very emotional about it because of what it means to them. And I think that keeps everybody motivated. So thank you. Okay, thank you. And uh, thank you, Patricia, for coming along to our committee meeting this morning, for engaging with members, and uh, also just to, to uh, reiterate the, the fact that, that uh, People really do welcome the progress that's being made here in relation to vaccines. And um, I think Alan's right there in the sense that people should be um, should be uh, aware that it, that it is a hugely, a hugely difficult program. But also, I think the point made around ensuring that people maintain the social distancing and continue to keep themselves and others safe in the time ahead um, and to follow all the, all the restrictions that, that are judged to be necessary. Um, I think that that would be important. So um, thank you for that, Patricia. I appreciate it. And we will um, no, no doubt be seeing you again soon. And hopefully all goes well in the meantime. Thank you. Thank you very much for your support. Thank you. OK. All right, Patricia. Thank you. OK, members, just check in there if there's any uh, comments or any anything members want to um, add or focus in on in relation to that session. Um, Chair. Yeah, go ahead, Paula. Thank you, um, Colm. I'm just wondering about the, the question I'd asked around the criteria, for example, for asthma sufferers, for example. And I, I think that there's clearly a crate, there's a grid somewhere. And I think that it would be useful for us to write to the department to see if we can get a little bit more clarity on that. Because I do appreciate what she says about the severity and the comorbidities and the complexities of people's underlying health conditions. But I do think that um, given the number of people who are asking for clarity, especially in relation to asthma, that um, it would, I think it would be um, a good idea to ask for that um, information that the GPs are working off. Okay, thank you. Are members content with that proposal? Yeah, members content. And I see a hand up from Pam there. Yeah, thanks. Yes, yeah, so I agree ahead, with Paula Pam. there. I agree with Paula there. I think it would be good to have that um, additional information. I also think we need to stress again, I know Paul has, has asked this question lots of times and Jerry mentioned shielding today, uh, but I think it's important that um, timely, a good, very clear advice is given to shielders on, on all aspects because there seems to be an awful lot of confusion always around the subject of shielding. In fact, uh, I noted that Michael McBride, I think it was this week, talked about um, the fact that they weren't using the term shielding anymore. And I think it's... It, it all leads to an awful lot of confusion. So I think there are many questions to be asked on behalf of Shielders uh, in terms of how they go forward from now. Um, so I would like to see more clarity uh, and I would like to see better um, communication made um, on behalf of or, or made available to Shielders so that they could get that information as quickly as possible, especially every time there's an announcement around uh, restrictions and the, the shielders seem to have to, to wait and they, they never know um, where that leaves them or how that impacts on them. So I think uh, there should be something more dedicated in terms of information for those people who have been shielding. Okay. Okay, members content with that. Just to clarify, Pam, are you suggesting that we write ask, ask them for a written update in relation to shielding? And we, I, I will flag up to members, we are uh, scheduled to have the minister here next week, so we can also raise some of these issues with the minister. But are you were, were you suggesting there, Pam, that we write and ask for an update as well, or, or are you content to... Yes, I would like to. I would like to us to write and ask for an update, but also that they would ask for some kind of dedicated um, method of communication, whether that's on the website or something. Something that's very up to date and very very clear in terms of all the issues around shielding. I think that's important, and I think that's going to be a long term thing. Something's not going to go go away in a hurry. So I think it would be worthwhile for the department to to provide that. Okay, um, I think members. And yeah, Carol, go ahead, Carol. Yeah, sure. I have no hand raising facility on my screen, so sorry for just jumping in. Um, I also would like no, to I see... No, I've seen your hand on the screen. All right, so I would like to see um, 
in written response before the minister comes to the committee. Um, I mean, the, the guidance around special educational needs schools, while well, I appreciate what Patricia said in terms of aerosol generating, but you know, you know, some of those children, some of the staff are looking at very intimate care for a lot of those children. And I, I'm still, I still think we need greater clarity on what the minister intends to do, um, because uh, it's still not clear in terms of the, the, the people, the staff at all levels who are looking after the children of special educational needs, not just learning disability. Okay, yeah, members content with that issue also? Yeah. Chair. Thank you. Okay, yeah, um, Pam, go ahead, Pam. Yeah, Chair, no, just to agree with Carl there, because I think that was what I was pointing towards as well, because really, when you talk about carers, it does open up this can of worms of what a carer is and, and who a carer is. And I think um, the, the staff of special educational needs, um, schools in particular, uh, and Carl's right, those intimate personal care needs and quests, it's very close contact, and it doesn't make sense that some of those individuals would not uh, be offered the vaccine, uh, you know, as a matter of priority. So I would have that uh, same concern. And in fact, I would just argue that I think it'd be simpler just to simply vaccinate all staff of those particular special edu educational needs settings. I think that would be appropriate. So I think we should ask around that again. It doesn't seem, it doesn't seem right that you'd be cher cherry picking, you know, in certain individuals who are doing certain procedures when, you know, the very nature of special educational needs will mean an awful lot of close contact for probably most of the staff. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there actually is a point there as well around the whole health and safety executive and their role in terms of supporting staff within workplaces and monitoring and ensuring that staff are, are being protected within workplaces. And I know there were issues at the start of the pandemic where health and safety executive were had largely withdrawn to an extent. But I think it might be useful to get an update uh, from the department in relation to the functioning and operation of the health and safety executive at this time and what role they're playing in ensuring that as we move forward, that workers are protected in, in their workplaces. Um, and and utilizing the learning that has been gleaned and, and hard gleaned over the over the course of this pandemic, where we know that some frontline workers in particular are extremely vulnerable to uh, and and exposed. So I think it would be useful maybe to look for an update on the health and safety executive's role and and uh, input at the present time as well, if members are content. Yeah, yeah. Been for that. Okay, thank you. Okay, members, thank you. I'm going to propose that we. Yeah, uh, Paula, is it? Go ahead, Paula. Um, uh, I would like to raise an issue about an uh, uh, agenda item later on in the meeting, but I'm happy to do it if you want to close the meeting down and raise the concern, and then if you want to move on from there. Or do you want me to raise it in public session? Okay, okay well, we are going into closed session later, um, later in the meeting, the Paula, session. you're aware of that. So if we can... it, it's about oh, the closed okay. session. Okay, thank you, Paula. Okay. And so, you can have to bring it up in a... No, what, well, I'll just raise it now so, then, Chair. We, we got the legal advice at 9.32, which was two minutes after the, the time that the meeting started. It's a 15-page document, and I don't think it's it's proper that we are trying to scrutinise the work of the Chief, Chief Nursing Officer, for example, coming up, and also then try and digest a 15-page legally privileged document. And so I would be proposing that we defer asking Jonathan to come along today at half 12 and ask him to come along next week when we've had a chance to go through this document, given the sensitivities and the complexities of the issue that I can see just from a quick scroll. Thank you. OK, members' views on that? Yeah, I think I think members are broadly content. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. I think okay. In light in light of that, in light of that coming coming so late, um, yeah, and 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 late com late papers are 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 increasingly, I suppose, an issue. But, um, I'm going to Jerry just first of all. No, chair, just to agree. I mean, I, I was trying to read it uh, while trying to listen to Patricia as well, and it's it's quite impossible to do. Uh, to be frank, so I would agree with Paul's proposal. Okay. Okay. Members are content with that. Okay. Thank you. 
Um, members, I'm going to propose that we take a, a very short break now before we go to the uh, substantive briefing with Charlotte. So could members come back on at 10.45, please? We'll take a 10-minute break and back for 10.45. Thank you, members. Northern Ireland Assembly. Thank you. Uh, thank you, members. So, members, we're moving now to our uh, briefing from the Chief Nursing Officer on workforce issues. Item six there uh, is a, um, I refer you there to a, a briefing note from the NACICTU Health Committee at tab 6.1 of your pack and to the Departmental Paper at tab 6.2 of your table pack. So I'd now like to welcome to our meeting this morning, um, Professor Charlotte McCardle, who's Chief Nursing Officer and who we have uh, met previously with, and Miss Heather Finlay, who is the Deputy Chief Nursing Officer. So I'd like to welcome you both very much to our committee this morning. Are you able to hear us, Charlotte? Yes, Chair. Thanks very much. Hi. Good morning, Charlotte. And are you able to hear us okay, Heather? Yes, Chair. Good morning, everyone. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, if I could just if I could just advise a uh, members of our panel there, if you have headsets, that's usually better. If you can try to make sure that your email um, is silenced, so that because we we understand how busy you are, and the emails will be pinging in as we speak. So, if you can just keep in those and. Uh, um, Otherwise, I want to welcome you both very much to our committee here this morning. We understand you're uh, doing significant amounts of work as it is already, and we appreciate you coming to the committee this morning and, uh, into, and, and are delighted to be able to explore some of these very critical issues around workforce, which we all understand are, are key to many of the many of the problems that we face and many of the solutions that we need to put in place so i think it's it's very worthwhile to get that so charlotte would you like to go ahead then and give us your briefing then we'll move into a question and answer session thanks very much thanks very much chair uh, for the invitation and the opportunity to address the health committee today on workforce matters uh, particularly per pertaining to nursing midwifery and, and allied health professions I mean, at the outset, I would want to pay tribute to all our staff who are working right across health and social care systems, in, in, including the, the independent sector, for their steadfast commitment, their uh, resolute re resilience and dedicated professionalism in responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. There's no doubt that the period from last March, uh, just coming up to a year since our first case um, until now, has been the most challenging ever faced by our health and social care system. And during this time of unprecedented pressure, our nurses, our midwives and allied health professions, along with all their colleagues in Northern Ireland, have courageously risen to the challenges that have been put to them in a very positive and a proactive and a solution-focused way to ensure that they continue to deliver safe, effective and compassionate care to the population. And as the Chief Nursing Officer for Northern Ireland, I am, of course, very, very proud of the outstanding contribution of, again, of all staff, uh, absolutely amazing, uh, the contribution of staff. But I'm here this morning to talk uh, specifically around nursing and midwifery and, and health profession, allied health professions, for the contribution uh, that they make and continue to make to the lives of individuals, families and the communities that we live in through, throughout this pandemic. This includes the valuable contribution of our nursing and midwifery and allied health professional support staff who have played a very, very important role and without them whom services just could not uh, function. It's been a complete privilege for me as a CNO to witness firsthand the exceptional dedication of all our staff in hospitals and in communities and at the independent sector care homes uh, in, in providing skilled, compassionate and uh, care in, in the face of great challenge and, and adversity. One such example um, experienced by nurses in particular has been the emotional burden when supporting patients to a peaceful death in the absence of their loved ones. In terms of uh, supporting the workforce throughout the pandemic, the department works closely with HSC Trust and has maintained a focus on ensuring there is sufficient capacity within the system to meet the exceptional demands on, on, on staffing requirements whilst taking co cognizance of the um, existing workforce challenges. The shortages of frontline uh, staff within Northern Ireland um, is an existing and well recognised and documented problem long before the pandemic emerged. And the department has instigated a range of measures over the last five years, really, uh, aimed at strengthening and supporting the workforce in, in the short and the medium and the longer term, um, appreciating that these things cannot be resolved uh, overnight. 
it is encouraging to note that early indications point to a downward trend uh, emerging in the in the workforce uh, vacancy levels from the all-time high that we had in uh, in 2017 at 13.1% um, down to what was 7.4%. But yesterday, the latest figures have shown um, a, a, an increase. At now sitting at 9.4 percent but nevertheless uh, at still a, a four percent reduction from the highest point in, in 2017 and while this is very 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 welcome we still have room uh, to go um, to reduce that further and we cannot be uh, uh, complacent in any way um, and we must continue to, to work to to rectify that situation um, the Minister and the Department, uh, as you know, is committed to grow in our local workforce and to that end has incrementally increased investment in pre-registration nursing uh, and midwifery training places, now sitting at a, an increase of over 86% from where it was in 2016. This means that we are already starting to, to reap the benefits of, of those increased numbers um, of nurses and uh, nursing and midwifery students graduating. And this year, I would anticipate there will be a thousand new graduates um, during the professions uh, in the summer autumn of 21. The new decade new approach commitment to fund an extra 900 pre-reg places is a significant boost to the support of rebuilding the nursing work and midwifery workforce and the first 300 of those extra places were commissioned uh, by the department last year and are currently uh, in training in the 2021 academic year giving us the highest ever levels of, of nurses and midwives in training at 1325 in our three local universities. The remaining 600 um, of these new decade, new approach places will be introduced over the next uh, two years to make sure that we reach that total of 900 additional students. Um, in terms of return to practice, furthermore, I would say that this academic year has seen an increase in the number of applicants seeking to a place in the return to practice program um, designated for nurses wishing to rejoin the professional register and in response response to this increased demand, additional investment was provided through the nursing education budget to facilitate an increase in places uh, this year. Alongside that, international recruitment has been a further measure employed to alleviate the nursing shortages. Since the regional campaign commenced in 2016, a total of 658 nurses have been recruited and remain in, in place uh, in posts in Northern Ireland. Despite suspension of the international recruitment uh, programme last March, um, from between March and, and September 2020, of the total 658, 218 of these nurses arrived in Northern Ireland between April last year and January of, of, of this year. We welcome and of course appreciate all our international colleagues um, who have joined the nursing workforce and are providing such a valuable contribution delivering frontline uh, nursing services. The executive commitment in, in January of 2020 to an investment of 60 million uh, by way of safe staffing over the next five years is also crucially important for enhancing the capacity and the capability of the nursing workforce to deliver on the transformational agenda and support the rebuild of services coming out of, of COVID. Implementing all the unfunded phases of delivering care, which is our policy for safe, safe staffing here, uh, is a priority and this investment will, will, will support that. Nurses and midwives as the largest professional group in the HSC sitting at around 35% are well placed to lead service transformation and this investment is really crucial to, to enable them to do so. It is uh, in this current financial year that the, we we receive five million, uh, the first five million of the sixty million, and, and that has been targeted to key areas uh, towards district nursing, mental health, and nurse, nursing in the emergency departments, along with other priorities um, as a result of the COVID uh, pandemic. It's imperative that the additional safe staffing resources are secured um, because we can't move forward with recurrent funding and recurrent posts without the additional investment and um, an additional 20 million has been sought uh, in for the next phase of, of, of the work. Um, in terms of um, the workforce initiative specifically for the pandemic, a number of additional targeted short-term interventions have been introduced throughout this period to assist and to support the workforce and protect frontline services. The workforce appeal uh, that was introduced in March of last year and then relaunched in October of last year to build further workforce capacity as part of the pandemic response across hospitals and community care. Use it, using a threefold approach, uh, the workforce appeal targeted retired professionals, the general public, and more recently the COVID-19 vaccination program. Each approach facilitated additional staff joining the workforce as part of the pandemic response. 
A total of 284 nursing staff have been appointed through the Workforce Appeal, and of those, 99 have been recruited specifically to support the regional COVID-19 rollout, the vaccination rollout. Sorry. Um, in terms of critical care, as part of the surge planning, the department has worked closely with the trust to ensure sufficient capacity within the system to meet the exceptional demands, particularly impacting on critical care, high dependency and respiratory medical wards in our hospitals. In response to these demands, um, experienced critical care and respiratory nurses were required to undertake additional responsibilities over and above that in their current roles as, uh, as band five nurses and to support unsupervised redeployed staff from other services to deliver care to the most critically ill. In recognition of this, a temporary uplift from band five to six from October the 1st last year until the 31st of March this year, um, received ministerial in, uh, approval sorry, in recognition of the increased responsibility and leadership role for those nurses who, who meet um, our regionally agreed criteria that was set. I must also mention the role of our allied health professional staff who have play, played a critical role in providing care and services. Rapid training was undertaken to upskill additional physiotherapists and dietitians and the wider AHP workforce to support critical care teams. Some of them were redeployed to non-registrant type roles to support proning teams in the Nightingale facility in, in Belfast. And again, I would commend all the staff for the very valuable contribution that they've made to the treatment of critically ill uh, patients and sustained services throughout the pandemic, which we know is, is um, continuing at this moment in time. And um, we still have a, a significantly high number of, of, of patients requiring critical care. A key priority during the most recent surge was ensuring a sufficient workforce capacity to enable flexibility to meet the growing growing demands. Faced within the rising service demands and, and nursing workforce pressure, so 110 military combat technicians were deployed um, as senior nursing assistants across a number of hospital sites for the nursing workforce. These are these staff are highly trained uh, and working really well, um, hit the ground running, um, and providing direct support to our nurses in the hospital network. They've been a very valuable asset in the current nursing workforce uh, at the peak of, of the pandemic surge and are leaving Northern Ireland uh, over the next few days to return to their normal duties. I want to thank all of them um, for their contribution. And, and as I say, they've really supported uh, the nursing workforce because of the skills they have and their ability, ability to hit the ground running. Our students also have pay, played a very important role and I want to acknowledge the contribution of the nursing and midwifery and allied health professional students on clinical placements during the pandemic. Their role as students and undergraduate programmes during such a turbulent time within our service has been already widely, widely uh, commended um, across, uh, right across the system and also by, by the Minister. In recognition of their contribution throughout the pandemic, the Minister recently approved a one-off payment of £2,000 to all non-salaried students on the Department of Health commissioned pre-registration programmes who were on a program between the 1st of October 2020 and the 31st of March this year, 21. During 2020, many nursing and midwifery students opted to undertake paid clinical placements and join the workforce while retaining their student status. This is only possible because the Nursing and Midwifery Council introduced emergency standards to permit these arrangements to happen until September of 2020. More recently, the NMC have reinstated emergency standards that allow flexible working across the UK for paid placements by third year students only to support workforce support the workforce during the pandemic surge. In Northern Ireland, the Minister has chosen with my um, support not to introduce this option again, but rather focus on supporting all our students to successfully complete their programmes on time and to join the workforce as registrants. And for me, a critical part of this is making sure that the thousand uh, students due to qualify this summer are enabled to, to do so. One specific cohort of nursing students of a group of about 100 have recently completed their undergraduate training and commenced employment within trust while waiting for their professional registration to come through from the NMC. Normally, such contracts are paid at band three until the, the registration is attained. However, the department approved to payment at band for, the, for this group to encourage them to take up employment at an earlier stage and to support, to support the pandemic surge. As our health and social care system slowly begins to uh, approach the, the post-pandemic phase, my overriding concern continues to be the well-being of staff. COVID-19 has placed enormous strain on our health professionals with, in all sectors and settings, and it's vitally important that all staff, irrespective of where they work, have access to information and support. Uh, 
that they may need over the coming months and that every everyone's contribution is valued and appreciated. No one should underestimate the physical, the mental, the psychological and the emotional impact that frontline staff have experienced over the past year. Although there, there is a legitimate and a pressing need to restart services at pace, such as elective surgery, it is absolutely imperative that staff, nursing staff in particular, are allowed time to recover. Um, we have a, an injured workforce that needs time to, to heal. The Minister, the Department and the Health Service are determined to provide whatever support they can to help people look after their mental health and well-being during this difficult time. The Department has worked alongside the, this, the HSE to coordinate a comprehensive response to the psychological impact of the coronavirus pandemic, both in the immediate and the longer term. Our regional staff wellbeing work stream uh, initiated in response to COVID-19 has worked closely with mental health services at the Health and Social Group Board, the Department and the Public Health Agency to build resources and support for staff. The Minister has published the framework supporting wellbeing needs of our health and social care staff during COVID-19, a framework for leaders and managers, which aims to ensure that we continue to prioritise evidence-led staff wellbeing initiatives and approaches. These measures with the framework um, include a range of initiatives across, across organisations which will enhance psychological well-being of staff. I'm taking a very personal interest in this and in providing higher levels of support for staff while recognising that individuals will need different support at different times. There should be no stigma attached to needing help or support by anyone during or after COVID-19 and not least our staff. It, it, it is okay to say that you're not okay and this is a message that we all need to clearly articulate. In terms of good news, um, we have the COVID vaccination programme operating very successfully and I know Patricia has just provided you with an update uh, around uh, the rollout of the vaccination uh, programme through the, the vaccination centres, care homes and, and GPs in primary care. We all know that the vaccination saves lives, protects people from serious illness and reduces the pressure on our health service. However, a vaccination programme on this scale is unprecedented and requires a significant workforce. Nurses, midwives, doctors, dentists, pharmacists and all other staff who step forward very willingly and enthusiastically to be involved in the delivery of this programme. I want to place on record my thanks to everyone involved in our vaccination programme at all levels. Yet again, our health service is stepping up to the mark for all, all of us. It's been a privilege for me as a CNO to join nurses, midwives and colleagues from across the health service to work together as a peer vaccinator and to roll out the COVID vaccine. I also want to commend the pharmacy, medical, admin and everyone else within the multidisciplinary teams who are working collaboratively to ensure that the COVID-19 vaccine are delivered safely and that strict infection control measures are maintained and in place at all times. As we continue to expand the COVID-19 vaccine programme, this will continue to have workforce implications to deliver on the vaccination rollout uh, right through until completion. Finally, uh, Mr Chairman, thanks for the opportunity this morning to um, update the committee on many of the issues that we have been working hard to, uh, to bring forward to support the workforce and happy to take any questions. Thank you. Okay, thanks, uh, Professor McArdle, and um, do, we do, do appreciate the briefing. And I suppose before we go into the question and answer session, I want to acknowledge your work and, and your team's work, and also every single one of those frontline nurses. And I will declare an interest that my wife is actually a nurse, a nurse in the community, um, and I, I myself have been a social worker with one of the trusts. What I have to say, the pressure that has been heaped upon and borne and, and born, I have to say, by nursing staff and all health and social care staff over the period of this pandemic has been absolutely outstanding, but has has pushed them to and beyond the brink of what anyone should or could be able to, to endure. So I think that's something we really, really need to take cognizance of. And I think the fact that we're all so aware that workforce was already such a, cru a, a chronic issue going into this pandemic, that in terms of coming out of it and building back better, we need to ensure that we do have a properly resourced and staffed workforce um, for the future. So um, I also, I also, and that is that is one of the reasons why I often refer to the the benefit that a properly functioning fine test GSA isolate and support system could and could have have brought to this in that. We all understand you can't overnight create nurses and, and many of the other very valued professions. It takes time to train and to educate and all of that. Um, but contact tracers that could have 
potentially prevented, I suppose, the hospitals and, and the health system coming under under pressure. And I would certainly hope that that in the future will be considered in terms of, of not allowing the, the, the health system to come under the pressure that we have seen at various times. So the first question then, Charlotte, for me is around multi-year budgets and, and the very disappointing decision to go back to, uh, uh, to present a, a one-year budget. <laughs> Given the long-term planning that's required for workforce and the strategic plan that's required around that, what's your assessment of the impact of not having a multi-year budget in place to to uh, recruit, uh, retain and and uh, put staff into the post where they're so badly needed? Um, so, uh, Chair, what, what I would say is that working on a, an, an annual budget, um, as we do, can you hear me okay? Yeah. I hear you. Yeah, hear you, Charlotte. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it's very complex. I mean, at, at system level, trying to manage from year to year is, is very difficult. So, in terms of uh, recruitment, in terms of pre-read places, where you know we have to uh, analyse that position every year in the context of um, what, what we need uh, in terms of pre-read numbers for nursing and midwifery, and also looking across the other workforces to see what they need because it's not it is a finite budget and it, because it's an annual budget we have to kind of stretch it as best we can. So it's very complex and difficult, and a three-year budget would be very helpful in order to plan out. Uh, on, a, on a more medium term um, I suppose plan how we can work to the best effect of both the frontline nurses and midwives but also other professional groups as well so um, my assessment is that it would be extremely helpful but I've, I haven't known it yet uh, in all the years I've worked in health and social care um, and so I think that we 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 do the best we can on a on a yearly basis okay Okay, thanks, Charlotte. Um, I, 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 I know you touched upon the issue there about rejoining the professional register, and that is an issue that I have become aware of over, over the past period of time. In response to a question that I had asked the minister, I think there was, a, in the past year, I think I don't, there was 85 applicants to the return to practice for nursing, and of that, 57, um, I think, successful. It would appear that 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 system is relatively complicated it's it requires a fair bit of um effort and sacrifice from the the nursing professional themselves in terms of of uh, working for a period of time in terms of paying for uniforms and all of those many things is it the case that that potentially we could have looked at streamlining that in the context of covid and even more generally moving forward does that system need to be reviewed and revisited in order to support and and uh, facilitate maybe more easily the return of nurses to practice, especially given the fact that many of those nurses will be women, will have additional care and responsibilities and things like that. And it's quite an onerous system um, to to work your, to to make your way back into the profession. Have you any uh, comments or thoughts on that, please? Um, so, so this is um, one area that Heather leads on. Uh, so I'll ask Heather to, to comment on a minute, but um, in a minute. But what I would say is that um, we do review the return to practice program very regularly. We have, have made some changes to it, but fundamentally, it's bound by the regulations of the Sorry, Nursing Charlotte, Council. Sorry, Charlotte, I, I, sure, I, I'm lost you there. I'm not sure. I just want to check with the clerk. And uh, clerk, are you here in Charlotte? Okay, is it just me, or is it is it a problem on Charlotte's end? It's it's coming through clear here, Chair. Okay, so it may be. So I uh, please go ahead, Charlotte. It must be just my connection. Maybe it's poor. Go ahead, and I'll hopefully, hopefully, before I pick it up. So, um, so y yes, we do review uh, regularly, and we have made some changes to the return to practice program. Um, but it is bound by the requirements of of the NMC, the Nursing and Midwifery Council, and we do on an annual basis flex up or down the numbers to try and accommodate as many people as we can. And I do absolutely accept that it is a big uh, sacrifice for people to return to return to practice. And there is a, 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 a large degree of, of commitment. But I'm not sure, um, Chair, if you have specific uh, ideas around how we could streamline this better than we currently do within the context of having to meet the regulations of the NMC. Um, I'm, I'm well, happy to well, have well, a well, well, discussion. Uh, Okay. Well, well, I suppose one of the things that would occur to me right away is my understanding is, and you can you can correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, nurses are required to work for a significant period of time unpaid, 
during that period. Now, it wouldn't it wouldn't strike me as being something that's a requirement of the professional standards that you work unpaid. So, could could we look at paying those nurses while they're going working their way through the system? Um. Yes, of course we can we can consider that. But in effect, most of these uh, nurses have been off the register for quite some time, um, and depending on how long they're off the register dictates how long that, you know they have to work for to meet the, the skills base. And the NMC have made recent cha recent changes to the to the program. So I, I'm going to ask Heather uh, if she provide a little bit more detail on that because I know it's not the same for every every person. Yeah, and just just for clarity, before Heather comes in, you know, I, I understand the need to re-enter at a, at a level where there's supervision and support, where you're you're regaining the experience or, or bringing. My 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 point around that is the fact that that has to be done at the expense of the person who's seeking to return to work. So I understand, and and all of us would want the system to be safe and rigorous and robust in in the sense of ascertaining that the nurse is properly supported to have that. But it's it's the fact that people have to work. I think for Quite a, is, is it 10 weeks or, you know, that, that a person has to find a post for themselves, I think, largely, and also work that post, work those hours without any recompense? Thanks, Heather. Heather, I'm not, I'm not hearing you there, Heather. Heather, sorry, I'm not hearing you. Keith, can I check there? Are you hearing Heather okay? No, there's nothing coming through from Heather at the minute. Okay, Heather, we're not we're not hearing your audio there. Um, will you go again there, please, to see if you you're not on mute, Heather, by any chance? No. No, no. So there's nothing at all coming through. If you just check your connection, um, maybe I'll move on to another question to Charlotte, and maybe if you can just see, can you? We're we're not hearing anything from you, Heather. So Charlotte, um. I'm going to I'm going to pop back to you, and maybe we can go back to Heather for that, or we can pick up on the end if, yeah. if necessary. Yeah, sure. The issue that we talked about uh, the last the last time around, um, or sorry, the issue you mentioned actually, I'll, I'll go to that issue. The issue you mentioned in relation to rest and giving staff that that break. What plans are in place for that, or how how do you plan to facilitate um, that very very much needed break for for staff who have been working under such pressure and such difficult. Uh, psychological and physical work conditions for so long. What what plans are you considering for that break that you've mentioned, that rest? So we uh, we've been having ongoing discussions with uh, the trusts, uh, particularly in relation to um, ICU and uh, closing the the Nightingale facility and allowing staff to return to their their base units. Um, you'll know that um, many of the ICU staff in the Nightingale Hospital actually had to. Be drafted in from other units. They have all now returned, and 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 for them that was the first step uh, in getting back to their to their base units to an environment that they are familiar with. And as part of that, we've asked the trust to uh, work in periods of leave for staff uh, before they 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 as they build up very slowly on their rebuild program. So the ministers asked uh, the trust to bring forward plans for the first three months. Um, on the new April, May, June, in terms of a rebuild program, so they're working at those in the middle at the moment, taking into account the need for staff to have annual leave. And as we are uh, reducing the number of beds in the in the Belfast Nightingale, um, staff will have the opportunity to get some leave uh, between now and and the end of the year. But that has to be agreed at local level, to, you know, based on their trust. Uh, ability to facilitate that leave and the areas in which which they work from. So uh, you'll know that there's quite a number of theatre staff working in the, in the Nightingale uh, Hospital at the moment. And um, again, before theatre uh, is, is maxed up, uh, um, we're, we're, we are allowing a period of, of leave for staff to take place. So it will be uh, a slow rebuild, um, slowly and carefully, uh, taking into um, consideration, I think, the need for uh, additional requirements in PPE and infection control to go back to normal business. So um, the num there are ability to do lists, et cetera, will be dictated by those needs as well. So it will be a little bit slower and uh, we will build it up very, very incrementally over, over the first three months, bearing in mind, obviously, uh, the need for our very urgent 
cancer patients and other conditions to be treated and to be prioritised. So it will be regionally pulled together by a group that meets um, on a weekly basis and will um, allocate um, cases and patients to units based on the availability of staff and, and resources. So it will not be a, a matter of stopping one day and starting full pace the next day. We, we couldn't do that anyway because of the requirements of PP and infection control. And in, in, in fact, it would be my belief and others that in doing so will actually um, increase sick, sick leave and the unavailability of work of our staff and will put us right back. So it's better to uh, take a little bit of time, do this carefully and ensure that staff have a break as we go through. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Charlotte. I'm going to just check back with Heather. I see Heather's back on the line there. So Heather, just uh, can, uh, can we go to you there and see if we can hear you now, please? Yeah. Can you hear me now, sir? I'm hearing you quite faintly, but I am hearing you. So if you can, if you can increase the volume at all, but I can hear you, Heather. Yeah. Okay. Um, which, uh, just to mention that then, um, back to the question. Um, the department does fully fund the education phase for the return to practice program. And um, we have been commissioning 32 places per year. Um, however, this year we were aware that there were more people who were successful at interviewing to get onto the program than there were places available. And we did make a decision halfway through this year that we would commission a further 17. So the total this year is. 49 places that we have paid for. And uh, that's to everyone who was eligible to get placed. The program is, committed, is run by Ulster University. And uh, there has been a brand new um, set of standards of child mentioned by the Nursing and Medicine Council. And there's two options that, that people can avail of if they wish to return to practice. One of them is to do the practice-based program, which Ulster University um, delivers. But people can also choose to return to practice and get onto the register um, by doing an OSCE exam as an objective structured clinical examination. So people can choose to do that to get without doing any practice. So the NNC have really widened the, um, the flexibility around the turn to practice. Um, when those who do choose to work in groups at, at Ulster University, they, they Ulster University have set that they would do different numbers of hours in practice, depending on how long they have been lapsed off the NSC register. Okay, uh, yeah, uh, and clearly the two options exist because the university option doesn't doesn't suit. And I think it's I think it's good that we refund the education fees because these are staff who are so valuable in terms of their experience. They're living here, they're embedded in the community here, um, and and getting those staff back obviously would be a key a key part of the the equation in in meeting the the shortfalls. But for those who it doesn't suit the university and who go, who go into the work. I mean, I'm not sure that has to be a massive disincentive, and I'm not sure how many people could afford to work for up to ten weeks without getting any payment. That has to be a significant barrier, and I think that's something that should really be looked at very, very urgently. Would there be scope to do that? Could you, could you, you know, it it just seems unfair, and it seems a deterrent. Well, yeah, Charlotte, we that they are students, so when they're out in clinical practice. Um, they do require our supervision and support, uh, which is similar to our pre-registration students who are coming in to do their things for the first time. So um, they, they are they are with the classes super numerate and they're not part of the workforce, albeit yes, you're absolutely correct, they're having to um, spend time in clinical practice updating their skills, which is so crucial for um, patient safety uh, and, and them being confident again. Um, we do know that the university um, liaises with the trust regarding the placement. So Ulster University take that upon themselves to make sure all of their students are placed. And I do know that the trust are very flexible in um, working around to see the hours that these students are available. But yes, we, we I totally take your point that 
they're having to do that, yes, in their own time, but while they're on a commission department of health program. Go ahead, Charlotte. The other point I, I would mention is that it, the return to practice program, unfortunately, doesn't yield a great return. Um, and many of, of those who do return, <laughs> return to work maybe one shift a week or at ad hoc hours or they join um, the bank, most of them do not take up paid employment on, on a, a, a significantly part-time or full-time basis. My concern is, Charlotte, that the reason there's not a huge uptake is because of the, the barrier. Ten weeks unpaid work, whether you're supernumerary or not, really is irrelevant in terms of how you manage to fund yourself through those ten weeks. That could be, I think, a significant barrier. I'm hearing, I'm hearing that it's a significant barrier. And on top of that, nurses have to pay for their own uniforms, pay for vaccinations. There are a number of other things that nurses... So it's like all the pressure and the onus is on the individual. And that, to me, doesn't chime with the fact that we need them so badly. We need their experience, their skills, their commitment. So I think it's a disincentive that, that should be looked at very, very, very quickly. So, so Chair, just to be clear, um, wh what I meant was those who complete the programme doesn't yield a great return for us uh, in terms of posts. Um, so, and they are students um, and have been off the register for a significant period of time. Um, and then the same as any other students, they, they need to update their clinical skills and, and practice. So I we're happy to that. take it away. And, I, I, under, I do understand that, Charlotte. I do understand the point you're making. What, what I'm saying is that may be a, a product of the fact that the people who make their way through the system have been able to fund themselves through the 10 weeks and therefore maybe aren't seeking to return to work full time, but to do, you know, so the people who maybe would take up are, are, are further disadvantaged people who are maybe, you know, whatever the circumstances may be. If you if you drill into that, you may find that that's part of the problem that you're you're saying, not part of the reason not to not to provide additional support. So anyway, I, th I appreciate the fact you've said. I don't want to spend too long on it. I appreciate the fact you've said you'll, you'll have a look at it. Uh, I think there may be be some merit in that. The final quick one for me, because I want to get the members, is around the cancer strategy. Charlotte, I, I attended a, an all party group with with Paula yesterday of the all party group on cancer, and I just wanted to quickly ask you around the cancer strategy um, it was supposed to be updated in, or launched in December. It hasn't happened. Can you give us an update on where that's at, please? Um, yeah, so um, all of the seven work streams have, are in the, in the process of uh, f uh, formulating their recommendations. We would hope to have uh, the uh, draft document ready by the end of March for the minister to approve um, to go out to consultation. Um, and that, that's our plan that we will have. It, it was agreed that it would be delayed because of COVID until the summer of this year. So our plan is that we would still want to um, give the seven work streams enough time to formulate their recommendations completely, given the pressures that are on both staff in terms of having to work during COVID. And um, you, you'll know that each of the seven work streams are co-chaired by a person with lived experience with cancer. So our ability to meet has been reduced, obviously, uh, and ability to get work done has been curtailed in, in some regard. We had anticipated that we would do some pre-consultation work uh, in the spring of this year and that we would bring, uh, you, you may remember, we had two very large uh, workshops with 75 people each, one at the start of the process and one uh, last January. And we had planned to repeat that uh, as part of pre-consultation. That's not going to be possible um, this year. So we're looking at alternative ways to engage with people over the next few months before the document goes to the minister for sign off for, for consultation, but it's on track uh, to be um, available for consultation before the summer. Okay. Uh, um, I, 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 I understand what you're saying there, Shard. I have to say I'm a wee bit concerned around what you said there, but because people are, are uh, experiencing cancer, that the ability to meet is curtailed. I think the entire world had very quickly moved on to Zoom and platforms like that. And I think there are, you know, I don't fully, I don't fully understand why that avenue couldn't have been used to keep the to keep the focus on. That same issue applies to consultations. I think there is no need to withdraw from the co-production, co-design consultation process in any sense. In that there are other platforms. In fact, in some ways, while some of the quality may be reduced, there are, there are ways to engage wider with people. 
So I don't, I don't accept. I have to say that that the ability to meet was curtailed because of because of. I think that could have been facilitated online, surely. Um, well, chair, we have been meeting online, and we uh, you know, we are having virtual meetings, but uh, the our ability to meet was curtailed either online or, or any other way because our staff, some of whom are chairing those work streams, were subsumed with COVID and working in COVID and were unable to that, prioritise the work of the cancer strategy. Uh, and and the co-chairs then couldn't... That's a different issue. I do, I do understand. That, 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 that's a different yeah. issue. I, I, I understood what you had said, that the issue was difficulty to meet because of their vulnerability to COVID and couldn't meet in person. So uh, I do understand there has been COVID pressures. Okay. Yeah, so that's why we okay. re re resorted to Zoom and we are meeting on Zoom, which has enabled many of the groups to catch up. There are one or two who are still uh, working on the final recommendations because of the pressures of COVID. Um, but as I say, we're, we, we are in the throes of having a draft strategy ready for the Minister in the next couple of months. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Charlotte. I'm going to go then to, to members. So I'm going first of all there to Pam Cameron. Go ahead, Pam. Thank you, Chair, um, and thank you, Professor McArdle, um, for your attendance at the committee today. Um, in relation to the report of the Nursing and Midwifery Task Group that was published last March, I understand mm -hmm. um, that you're responsible for the impl implementation of the recommendations. Are you able to provide uh, an update for, on this work, and do you have an implementation plan with associated time scales? and if so, will it be shared with the committee so that we can monitor the progress and um, thanks um yes we we have made some headway with the nursing and military task group re report and some of the recommendations have been implemented for example um increasing the nursing and military education budget the increase in undergraduate places um has been taken forward uh we have begun work um on on other elements around safe staffing um as you'll note uh we've we've it, the work has obviously been delayed significantly because uh, my team here are working on on covid and have been doing so for the last year so we've delayed further implementation that's not to say that some work hasn't been taken forward but i can only uh, tell you that it has been delayed because of covid however we are um looking forward now to uh, the new uh, financial year and coming out uh hopefully um, starting to rebuild services and the nursing military task group is completely aligned with the rebuild and transformation of services. Um, so we will be get, we will be planning to um, take that work forward through co-design and, and consultation uh, with each of the five uh, trusts and uh, for uh, our independent sector colleagues who are co terminus with those localities to be involved in um, feedback on the nursing military task group. Uh, we had we had appointed three uh, subgroup chairs and three work streams which weren't able to be taken forward because of COVID um, and we will be developing an implementation plan and I'm very happy to share that with the committee. That's great and um, thank you for that Charlotte and I should have said Chair that uh, I should declare an interest as having a family member who is a, a nurse um, and I also want to thank you Charlotte for um, in your in your uh, briefing to us so you talked about the temporary uplift from band five to six from October 20 to March 21 for those redeployed to deliver care to critically ill and that is um, very much welcome. I wonder have you, have you any other comment uh, uh, just around um, that band five to six issue which I know is a, a great um, uh, cause for concern amongst nursing staff um, in terms of uh, pay progression so that issue. is the one recommendation in the nursing military task group uh, report um, that the minister wasn't able to sign off and he had asked for more work to be done uh, in relation to that recommendation which again unfortunately has been completely delayed because of COVID uh, and is unlikely to be to be able to be picked up in the foreseeable future at this stage. Um, the priority uh, for us in the department has been about putting together a safe staffing bill team to begin work on the safe staffing uh, framework. So um, that recommendation of band five to six uh, review will remain delayed, uh, I think, for the foreseeable future. That's very disappointing, um, Charlotte. OK, um, another question for you. I wanted to ask you about um, what impact the department's failure to fund the, the 300 extra nursing and midwifery places in the next financial year will have on the provision 
of care in the medium term? Um, well, it's our, it's our anticipation at this time that we will continue to fund um, those places from our budget, even though we don't have a final uh, agreement on what that budget is at this moment in time. Um, if we are unable to uh, provide those additional places, I think the, the good work that's been achieved to date on the reduction in vacancies from 13.4% to currently 9.4% um, will be further delayed. Um, and we will be uh, in this very difficult workforce recruitment cycle for much longer than we would have anticipated. I've actually commissioned some work on modelling of the workforce numbers, uh, which I don't have yet, but again, I'm happy to share that with the committee when I get them about um, what numbers we need to continue to grow to meet the demand and to make sure that we have a more stabilised nurse and midwifery workforce. So any any delay in, in the recruitment of those additional numbers will just set that back by um, a, a correlation in, in years. Okay, thank you for that. Okay. Okay, thank thank you, Pam. Um, so I have then indications from um, and and sure, just to say there's, there's a slight delay in the line, which I think uh, yeah. causes a wee, a wee bit of but but anyway, I, that's that's manageable. It's only when people are trying to come in again there's a wee delay and it seems to be cutting over. But anyway, I have indications now in the in the in the following order from Jerry, Orlea, Carol, Paula, Jonathan, and Alan. So I'm going to go uh, now to Jerry, Carol. Go ahead, Jerry. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Charlotte. Um, my screen isn't working, but I'm hoping you can hear me okay. Uh, so jump in if you can't. Uh, a couple of uh, questions. I'm just going to do them uh, all together because there's quite a lot, but, but I think it's, it's useful to find out uh, information on this, Charlotte. Um, I'll do them all together here and, and, and listen to your replies, obviously. Um, what about the Occupational Therapy uh, Workforce Review Report uh, and plans to increase commission places for OTs? Uh, where is that at? Uh, secondly, um, how have staff and care homes found the implementation of the care partner uh, role and what is the current department figure uh, over many care homes um, who have implemented care home partners? Uh, additionally, what is the current sickness levels for nurses uh, in trusts? And, and finally, um, safe staffing you obviously referred to and you referred to the, the £20 million, pounds, but that hasn't obviously been accounted for in the draft uh, budget. Um, given that if it isn't um, accounted for or uh, awarded, and also given the lack of safe staffing legislation being processed, how concerned are you about the safety of uh, nurses in hospitals and, and other settings? So that's my, my questions. Um, okay, so I'll start at the start. Occupational therapy, um, the workforce report has been um, completed and we are currently agreeing the commission places for for next year. Um, off the top of my head, Jerry, I can't remember the figure. I think I think it's quite a small uh, uh, figure um, yet to be agreed for the commission uh, of next of next year. Um, so that work is in is in train, and uh, we had a meeting of the steering group for the AHP workforce uh, about two weeks ago, and a number of the um, professional plans were signed off at that stage um, as complete. Um, and I'm sorry, I can't give you any more detail on that exactly uh, today, but I'm happy to follow that up. Um, care home and care partners, um, I think your question was in, in relation to the number of homes that have uh, introduced care partners. We think at this moment in time that um, it's around one third of care homes um, and increasing slowly. Uh, as people uh, begin to um, put plans in place with families ar around the, the assessment for, for that. Um, sickness levels in trusts, um, I do have that information. I think Heather, Heather might have it. Um, Heather, I think I think we have just lost you again. Heather, I think there's a slight connection problem. Um, we can just check with the clerk. You, you, we could just hear you right at the very first word or two, and then it cut out. Um, could you try try again there, Heather, please? No, Heather. Sorry. We, a uh, clerk, can I check with you? Are you hearing Heather? 
No, there's there's no audio coming through, Chair. No, there's no there's no audio coming through. Again, maybe whatever you did the last time to resolve that, Heather, I don't know whether it's a sign out and back in again, but we'll maybe go back to Charlotte and ask her to deal with the other parts of Jerry's questions, and then we'll try back to you again. Thank you. Go ahead, Charlotte. So the the current vig is the current sickness um, by number is one thousand six hundred and thirty four, and that would include obviously uh, COVID and COVID related illness. Um, so and then the final question was in relation to safe staff, and so um, uh, work has, has begun to put a build team together to look at the requirements for safe staffing, um, and we there. there are, obviously different ways of doing this and we need to look at uh, what other countries have done and, and use the evidence base that we have that will take um, significant time um i remain concerned about the, the nursing workforce uh, given the current level of vacancy we have and the pressure that's been on them everything that can be done is being done in terms of uh, support uh, in the growth of, of numbers overseas nursing any additional uh, training uh, as you know, we have a we have eight to ten applicants for every undergraduate place in nursing. So it isn't an issue about people wanting to become nurses. It's an issue about the number of places that's available and the number of um, practice placements that can be then associated with those training places. So it isn't just even as simple as increasing. In fact, I would say we couldn't go above the current 1,325 that we have, and we won't be able to sustain that level of of program uh, for more than the three years that's recommended by a uh, new decade new, new approach because of the implications it has on practice placements so it is a, it's a complex issue in terms of growing the nursing workforce and does take time um directors of nursing and trusts are reporting to their trust boards uh frequently on 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 issues uh key performance indicators around safety of patient care and nurses are self reporting any issues around uh, safety of care so they are being monitored and measured on a on a daily basis um, a weekly basis and then up to trust board so um, I'm content that the processes are in place to maintain patient safety and where specific issues arise Jerry that those are dealt with at local level by trust um, and I'm not sure if I fully answered that question yeah I'm sorry you. Oh, thanks. Uh, just a quick follow-up there, Chair. Um, I think the, the a third of car homes uh, having car partners is very, very low and very, very worrying. Um, we've had a directive, obviously, I think it was October last year from the department and the minister, uh, and a lot of these car homes are receiving public funding uh, and assistance, and they're not uh, two-thirds of them aren't uh, implementing the car home partner scheme is very, very worrying. And obviously the, the, the levels of sickness uh, of nursing uh, and trust is very high as well. Uh, I think on the safe staffing, I mean, I'm very concerned because this was obviously one of the, the key factors on, on um, in relation to nurses and healthcare workers taking strike action last year. And the fact that the legislative clock is ticking down very, very quickly, uh, don't remain convinced that there's going to be the opportunity, happy to be corrected, but don't remain convinced there's opportunity to process legislation before the end of this mandate. That would be very uh, disappointing. And just finally, um, I don't know if you're aware, Charlotte, I've, I've asked the minister to uh, look at this but um, one avenue in terms of increasing healthcare capacity may be uh, lifting restrictions on people who have uh, who are refugees or asylum seekers or have uh, limitations uh, due to their, their immigration status and what they can do in terms of not being able to work uh, at all so um, I've, I've raised that with the minister in a, an assembly question but I don't know if you have any information on that that could be one avenue that could be explored further thanks okay and I'm just going to um, yeah, go ahead, Charlotte. Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to come back on the, on the legislation, um, Chair, if you don't mind. We have already asked um, that the legislation be included in the forward work uh, plan for the Assembly for the next mandate. So, uh, Jerry is correct, it's not going to be possible in this mandate. Okay, okay, and and I I have to say I do share Jerry's concern around that 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 is a key factor in terms of the the industrial action and and a key thing that needs to be resolved in terms of supporting staff and providing the service. But I, I want to check back with Heather to see if we've got you back on the audio. Heather, can you try again there, please? Yes, Chair. Um, can you hear me now? Much much better. Actually, that's a lot clearer. So whatever you've done yep. there is definitely better. Okay. And if, if I could just add one point there, uh, just on the back of what Charlotte has said regarding the safe staffing, um, that the, we know there is a group in the department who are meeting very regularly 
there's a safe staffing delivery framework and there's a smaller subgroup of that now meeting monthly specifically around legislation and uh, I just was informed yesterday that the f first two um, posts have been secured of that um, legislation team so the department is actively progressing that and um, it was agreed that because it there wouldn't be time in this mandate to actually pass legislation however work will progress to draft the bill so very much as a priority and um, we're taking that taking that forward okay okay thank you and and is that what the point you were going to make are you going to touch on the care, the, the care homes when you were coming in originally in that in jerry's answer no, it was about the sickness no, okay. but charlotte covered that oh. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. So I'm moving on then to Arlea Flynn. Go ahead, Arlea, please. Thanks, Colin. Um, so just maybe to, to touch on the workforce um, issue again, Charlotte, if you if you don't mind. Um, and you had said in your opening remarks that obviously there's going to be continued implications um, for the workforce um, until we're we're fully out of um this period of, of of covid and and you're right your staff definitely do need to have the time to to heal and and to rest and they absolutely deserve that um so on, on the issue around um with i suppose the health system trying to resume to go into some form of normality um in relation to theater capacity and you have mentioned that um so you need to allow for a period of need until the theater capacity goes back to full capacity um, and I suppose I'm, I'm just worried how how you do that because we know of the pressures um, the pressures on the waiting lists at the moment and they're only gonna um, they're only obviously going to get worse so is it is the department and yourself um, as chief nursing officer are you looking at any other options around trying to um, you know utilize private health care um, or I'm conscious that you had mentioned in the workforce appeal, there was um, so the 284 nursing staff and 99 staff helping with the vaccine rollout. Um, but I know in the briefing mm -hmm. that we got in November, um, there was 5,000 formal applications. So is there even any options there that you can try and help in the sort of short to medium term um, to help with your capacity, either out of the, the workforce appeal or out of um, private health care? Thanks. Um, thanks, Orlea. Um, so the first thing to say is that uh, it's going to take a significant time uh, for the health service to get back to what will be a new normal, um, a different way of working, um, taking learning from COVID, and there has been quite a bit uh, of learning about how we all work in the system. And as I say, um, even if we were to get back to normal functioning, we are restricted by what we can do in terms of uh, testing patients, um, the use of PPE and ensuring good infection control uh, in our system. And that's going to be with us for, for the very foreseeable future and longer. Um, so getting back up to full capacity will take uh, significantly longer than three months or six months. Uh, and I just want to be very clear about that. Um, it isn't a matter of flicking a, a switch off and another one on to go from one to the, the other. Um, so in terms of the workforce, um, Yes, we will. We trust, as I say, have been asked to develop plans for um, for sites where, for, where surgery can take place, and um, there may be the opportunity for workforce appeals specifically for that work that will draw on the skills of people who've worked in those environments previously, and who maybe couldn't contribute to COVID uh, to the response for various reasons, who, but who may be willing to or, and can contribute to this. So we will be exploring that. The independent sector remains a key remains a key partner in the provision of, of of elective care, and that's been fully explored by the Health and Social Care Board both in this year and and thinking about going forward for next year. Um, we are severely limited in our ability to, uh, to to look at creative and innovative ways to do this because of uh, the financial situation we're in, and it would take a significant, a very large amount of money um, to try and rectify some of the some of the the long waiting lists that we currently. They have and so what we're proposing to do is to uh, prioritize people on clinical need and make sure that those that are most in need are the ones that are treated um, at the top of the queue so to speak and I, I realize for, for people who are waiting in pain and who've been waiting for a very long time that will be very disappointing news for them to think that their, 
there is no quick fix to this. We will have to work at this consistently and steadily as both our workforce and our, and our financial uh, situation allows us to do so go, going forward. But it is absolutely top of the department's priority. And I know that the minister is absolutely a key priority for him uh, about how we move forward with this. Okay, Charlotte, thanks very much um, for that answer. And just my final question then is around, um, so I, I, I'm glad to hear that, and I'm not surprised that obviously the well-being of, of your staff is now your, you know, your, your main overriding concern. I um, completely understand that. And um, I know you had mentioned some um, investment and the framework that's already in place around the well-being, and I know the psychological mm -hmm. helpline is in place. I'm just wondering, um, are you are you taking a look at the, the the levels of uptake on that psychological helpline and um, the I mean are you going to be guaranteed sort of resources for those longer term mental health and wellbeing plans within the trusts for your staff? I know that whenever we had met previously last year, um, one of the meetings I think it was around the access to maternity um, units and. We we'll had a discussion around even some of the inconsistencies across the different five trust areas, you know, with how some of these things were being developed. So at the time you were saying that um, I think that you were doing uh, weekly or fortnightly regular meetings, you know, with all the chief executives of the, the five right. trust. And I'm just wondering, is that is that going to continue? And, you know, we're then I suppose you can all come together to make sure that everyone has that same focus on trying to support the staff and whatever help. And support's going to become available to them, particularly post-COVID plans. It's important that everyone is going to have the same access to it, I suppose. Um, so um, we continue to meet with the the trust chief, exec chief executives and um, the permanent secretary chairs uh, at a weekly meeting, and and sometimes more than once a week uh, meeting with the trust chief executives, um, twice a week um, on on many weeks. Uh, depending on on the items for discussion, but that is a forum where I would bring proposals, and we have discussed the mental health and well-being uh, proposals with the trust chief executives. Um, I've also taken a proposal to uh, Gold Command, which is part of our uh, our response to to COVID, and and they have signed off a, a proposal to um to, to pilot um a, a, an approach in the Belfast Trust across all of their ICU facilities. Where staff will be able to self-assess themselves in terms of their mental health and well-being that will then be triaged and assessed by a qualified mental health practitioner and um depending on on level of need will be signposted to an appropriate service so we're looking at a very step care approach depending on the needs of the individual which i think over time i may change for people uh where uh, and a concern that i do have is that staff are working full uh throttle at the moment and when they take their annual leave and they stop running very hard, they may realise that they are actually uh, in a different place mentally and physically than they had thought. And, and we all know that from our own experiences. When you stop, sometimes you realise that uh, the environment you've been in has had a bigger impact on you than you originally thought. So I think at various points over the next six months, staff will need different responses. But there is a commitment to undertake this work and that the funding for that has been agreed. Um, we will have to relook at uh, all of the proposals for next year in light of the new financial budget. Um, but I have no doubt that the the mental health and well-being of, of our staff is such a priority that we will be able to continue to provide that. You also asked about the helpline, and so it's my understanding that the psychological therapies helpline hasn't had a great response, um, but occupational health has had a much bigger response. And I suppose we need to understand why that is. And, uh, and and to maximise the opportunity for staff if they're using one particular type of response, that all of the support that they need is available through that through that mechanism. Thank you, Charlotte. It is important, I think, that we continue to support our staff uh, with with supervision and the opportunity to uh, talk about um, and reflect on their practice. And um, again, I've brought forward um, a program of work for nurses working in ICU across all of Northern Ireland. From the 1st of April, we'll have access to restorative supervision and we've put a training programme in place through the Clinical Education Centre in March to facilitate supervisors to do, to do that. So again, that has been uh, warmly received, I think, by the nurses in ICU and it mirrors an approach that has been taken uh, particularly in England. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Charlotte yeah. and uh, Arlea. And I'm going then to Carol Nikhilin. Go ahead, Carol, please. Uh, thank you, 
um, Charlotte and Heather. Um, I want to go back to, first of all, the issue of students' pay and the fact that they're going on to ban four. So I just want to ask what that means. I also want to ask, um, for example, uh, issues around um, the the respite and the support that staff are getting, um, particularly, you know, I mean, as you said, the plans for April, May and June that the Minister plans to redeploy the staff back to their original posts. Exactly what, what does that respite look like? And the last thing I'll ask is um, in relation to our respiratory and intensivists going back to their workplaces, uh, I take it that's across all health trusts um, because I mean, I'm particularly concerned about the matter uh, and the respiratory expertise there. Um, will the staff be come back as well as the HPB um, special specialists and indeed all the intensivists around that. And then the last thing is, given the fact that we're going to be looking into a period regarding long COVID, um, what additional respiratory um, funding um, is you know being put in to the budget to support the potential for um, all health and social care dealing with issues around long COVID and um, even just in terms of mobility. And have you flagged this up to the minister when he was doing his high uh, uh, impact screening exercise instead of a full equality impact exercise as something that is potentially going to have an adverse impact, particularly on people with disabilities, palliative care, and even in terms of mental health. Thank you. Um, thanks, Carl, for those. So um, in relation to student uh, pay, um, as you know, our students, when they undergo, undergo their, their undergraduate programme, they're super numerary and are not paid. Their, their, their university fees are paid and they also receive a bursary uh, from the department to assist them through their undergraduate years as, as trainees. Um, this year was exceptional in terms of the COVID response. And as I said, my remarks, a number of students offered for a paid uh, up took a, a paid placement um, as part of their, their, their training. So we were able to, uh, because the NMC changed the standards, offer them paid placements, but at the same time, their learning and their, their hours in practice went towards their final undergraduate degree, which was uh, changed. That stopped again at the end of September last year. Um, and from the end of January this year, the standards were amended to allow that to be put back in place for third years only. Um, the minister decided not to, to uh, employ that, um, to have the third years paid, uh, because our priority is to make sure that those final year students in particular qualify in the summer um, and they're not uh, impeded to do so um, by being put, put, in, put out into uh, practice environments for a period of time that interferes with their, with their, their, their programme for, for their degree. And we do have some instances um, where, where students have been uh, delayed by a number of weeks and months already. So, and this group in particular, were the same group that were out on paid placement last year. So another, an episode of that would have actually, um, in many cases, um, not enabled them to complete their degree in the summer. And therefore, you know, for me, the importance of having a thousand new registrants out into a workforce with a vacancy rate of 9% takes priority there. And the minister agreed a one-off payment of £2,000 to each student to recognise their contribution uh, to the pandemic, which has been warmly received by, by the students. Um, the band four um, issue, uh, Carol, um, normally uh, it, when the nurse, the students are finished their academic programme, they have to wait a significant period of eight to 12 weeks for the registration to come through. During that time, they're often employed as band three nursing assistants. Um, in order to get them into the workforce and get them prepared for taking on their their, their registered nurse uh, post, they become familiar with the environment, the staff team, etc. In this case, with the cohort of Queen students who qualified in February, uh, in order to ensure that they they um, undertook, there was no delay in them coming into practice. And because of the COVID situation, the department actually um, uh, offered them band four uh, posts 
for that period of time between finishing in university and getting their full registration. And again, that was a one-off situation uh, to respond to, to the COVID pandemic. I'm not sure if that's been helpful to you in terms of it is it is not straightforward and quite complex. Okay, so what about the rest of you? Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Um, so moving on then to um, the next area, which um, was about uh, respite and support for staff. Um, as we go forward, what does that look like? Well, um, th that, that means that uh, in terms of rosters, uh, staff will be allocated annual leave where possible, and that the service provision may have to continue to be incrementally increased to allow that to happen. So, um, so surgery will restart slowly. It also gives staff the opportunity to reconnect with their familiar environment. So if you're a nurse that's been redeployed to um, ICU or medical ward, who normally works in theatre, uh, you need to go, need the opportunity to go back in and reconnect as a team. The theatre team in particular are a very, very close-knit team from the surgeons, the nurses, the support staff, the anaesthetic cover, etc. And then they need to reconnect and, and rebuild their team um, efficacy because that actually is really important in maintaining patient safety. Um, in, in the theatre environment. So um, that gradual increase in staffing in, in theatre capacity allows the staff to get back to the normal environment, deal with any um, health and wellbeing issues there might be, and to allow the staff a period of leave. And each of the trusts will develop their own plans at local levels to accommodate that. So the next one then was uh, respiratory and intensivists. Um, there are currently 20 beds open in... Um, Nightingale and all the staff from other hospital, other trusts, I should say, have re been redeployed. Um, the intention would be to get uh, Nightingale closed um, as soon as we can, um, bearing in mind there's still a requirement for a high level of, of intensive care beds uh, and to redeploy the Belfast Trust team then back to their normal environment. So um, I can't say hand in heart today that all of the respiratory and intensivists are back in the matter, Carl, but the plan would be that that we will res resume normal activities and normal work environments um, as quickly as possible. But, but the, the reduction in ICU beds has been very, very slow. Um, and, and we're now at the end of February, and it's likely that it will need another few weeks before we were able to get the Nightingale Hospital closed. And even at that, it means that all, unit, all units will have additional beds in place over and above what they normally would have um, as we try to, to, to get things back on track. It's been very, very slow in terms of um, the reduction of ICU beds because uh, people who require ICU because of COVID uh, stay much longer than a normal ICU patient. And then the recovery in the medical wards is also much longer than a normal medical patient. So um, it, it, it's just um, it's, it's difficult to manage. Uh, um, and at the same time, we have to be able to provide enough beds for the region in the event that we would need uh, major trauma beds or a major road traffic accident. So we have to keep capacity in ICU to be able to manage all eventualities. Therefore, we're cautiously slow about releasing those beds. Okay, and yeah, I think the other one was funding, funding for long respiratory COVID, given, um, given the impact of long COVID. Yeah. So uh, work has begun and the board is actually taking this forward as commissioner. Uh, for a new service model for uh, for long COVID, um, and it's currently in in progress um, at the moment. Um, and until the the model is worked out and the business case is is progressed, it would uh, it's hard to identify at this moment what the cost would be and therefore what resources would be uh, needed. But as that work is brought forward, uh, discussions will be ongoing in relation to that. Okay. Okay, thank thank you. And moving then to Paula Bradshaw. Go ahead, Paula, please. Um, thank you very much, Sharon. Thank you, um, Charlotte, and your team for being here this morning. My first question is in relation to theatre nurses. Um, obviously, quite a number of them have now been redirected in the ICU wards, etc. But I'm just concerned about the wider issues around cancer waiting lists for surgery and the existing vacancies. So I wonder, could you speak to that in terms of how the vacancies compare to other branches of nursing and also what is being done to actually recruit into those posts because of how vital the, the rebuilding of that, of that um, particular branch of healthcare is going to be at the far side of this? Um, thanks, Paula. So theatre nursing, um, as you say, uh, many of our theatre nurses have been, been um, redeployed to, to other areas because they were the group of nurses who actually have 
um, the best level, uh, the best type of skill, I suppose, in caring for uh, an acutely ill patient or a critical care patient and a patient that's unconscious. Um, we know that about 25% of all theatre nurses are currently were, were redeployed to ICU and many others were redeployed to medical wards, which also uh, required a much higher level of intensity um, of nursing. They are at the moment, as I say, being redeployed back to their theatre environments. Um, there is a, there is a higher level of vacancy in some theatre uh, units across Northern Ireland um, than you would uh, expect to see it, it, when compared to other types of nursing. And um, I have asked um, Mary Hines um, and uh, NIPEC Northern Ireland Practice Education Council to bring forward recommendations and how we might begin to address that. So um, already they have produced um, a, a recruitment brochure which um, is available for theatre nurses to try and uh, attract people both into theatre nursing but also uh, attract uh, people home from other parts of the world um, back into theatre nursing. They are in the process of finalising their recommendations uh, to me which I will take to the regional management board uh, for sign off onto the minister about how we will uh, progress um, what needs to be done to promote theatre nursing as a career. So for, ex for example, um, student nurses or nursing students don't necessarily have a placement in theatre and I think there's a great opportunity to increase the number of practice placements available for, for, for nursing students and it's one of those areas that if you're not exposed to it it's hard to know what goes on and therefore your tendency to apply for a post care might be, might be limited. So we're working with trust to do that, we're working with trust to promote career uh, development opportunities for theatre nursing, new and expanded roles, um, career progression, uh, different ways of working um, and trying to really work with the theatre nursing staff to understand what their personal and professional issues are and then to put a plan in place to try and address that. And as we continue to grow the numbers of nurses who come out from, uh, to practice from, from training, um, slowly that will that will resolve but it will take a, a number of, of years yet and at the same time looking to see what support worker roles can can help in that, that environment and if there's anything we can do with the theatre list to ensure there's a, um, a good working environment for, for the nurses as well as the multidisciplinary team. So the work on that space is very much on my agenda and the Minister's agenda and we are waiting on that uh, report back from NIPEC uh, uh, chaired by Mary Hines and we will take it from there and again happy to share that with the committee when I get it. Thank you. Um, the second issue is in relation to district nursing and I am aware you've, you've touched on it so far um, uh, but and I got a letter back from the health minister there this morning I haven't had a chance to fully read it but I'm aware that there is some recruitment processes ongoing but um, people who are, who are in band six have contacted me when they have seen jobs advertised in band seven and you may not want to talk that far down into the sort of operational issues but there doesn't seem to be a uniformity of approach in terms of um, reviewing job descriptions and then um, re-advertising and I think some people who are in the lower bands are feeling that they're being undermined despite the fact that they would have the specialist qualification so is there any move towards sort of regional approach to recruitment for district nursing? Um, so Paula, the, the, the issue with district nursing goes back to agenda for change, um, where some district nursing sisters, and it is the district nursing sisters, charge nurse, and those with a specialist qualification, that's the group that we're talking about here, were banded differently in different trusts depending on their job role at the time. Um, I mean, obviously time has moved on and the, the direction of travel in terms of transformation, neighbourhood district nursing, supporting multidisciplinary teams around GP practice, um, does require that specialist qualification and level of practice. And again, uh, NIPEC on my behalf have taken forward a career pathway, uh, one of which is the district nursing uh, specialist practice qualification and a regional job description is, is now in place. So where trusts are implementing that new job description in ter terms of transformation and working as multidisciplinary teams, those, those jobs are advertised at band seven. However, there is still a cohort of staff who were originally banded at band six who may be doing a slightly different role and that would be for trust to comment on because I wouldn't have that level of detail but I would want to assure the committee that um, there is now a regional job description in place that matches the transformation agenda and will be closely aligned to the safe staffing work and um, 
I did say in my open remarks that we had prioritised district nursing in terms of delivering care, and it's in that context that the Band 7 rule will be implemented. But again, it will take time to, to implement and um, as people move through and posts become vacant, etc., all of which the trust uh, will have to manage. And I can't really comment beyond that because I think it does vary across trusts. Thank you. And the last question um, picks up also on the issue of long COVID. Um, so can you maybe talk about how many of the nursing staff, allied health professionals here, who have potentially, not necessarily within the, the occupation, but have been off um, for a long time, sort of recovering from COVID? Um, and also then how the uh, allied health professionals and the nursing staff are gearing up to actually deal with these post-viral symptoms and the um, potential for thousands of people right across the country who will need that treatment. And I suppose that reflects then in the Occupational Therapy Workforce Review Report and how that's having to now be modified around how uh, the limited um, AHPs, um, how they will be deployed in the health service going forward. Thank you. Um, so I think that the long COVID work, as I've already said, has been taken forward by the board and Jenny Keane, who's the Chief Professional Officer for the Allied Health Professions, is, in, is involved in, in that work. Um, and we, we have taken the opportunity to review some of the AHP work, workforce plans in light of that. But I, don't think it's, I think occupational therapy is key to this, absolutely, but I don't think it's just occupational therapy. I think there are other professions uh, that need to be considered. And, and as I say, until the model is put together, until we understand what the business case looks like, it's hard to, to line, up, line all of those things up um, exactly right. Um, so the work is ongoing in that space and um, there is already models starting to emerge around what that would look like. So I, I can't really comment any more on that until the, the board bring forward the work, uh, Paula, in that regard. In terms of um, nursing absence, we, we, we already gave you the number for um, the, the, the current sickness level in nursing and as I said, a number of those is related to, to COVID. Um, and I'm just looking to see here if I can find the exact uh, number of people who are off with COVID-related illnesses um, at the moment. And I, I think, Heather, you probably hear Heather just saying there's 182 uh, nursing staff who are off with COVID-related, either long-term, short-term, or isolating um, okay. at the moment. That obviously changes on a, on a monthly basis. And, and uh, as I'm, very a, I'm very concerned, Charlotte, just the final point really about the length of time it may take some of the, your staff to recover. I'm just wondering what additional financial or other um, wise support they can be given, um, because obviously there will be on terms and conditions with the trust or their employer in terms of how much sick leave they can have. But they may then go further than that. And I know some of them are feeling very stressed that they may have to return to work before they're fully recuperated. Um, so, so, I mean, it'll be for employers to work out the details of, of sickness uh, schemes, and obviously that's all tied into agenda for change in the contract. And I wouldn't want to comment on that, Paula, but I take your point and something that I'm, I'm happy to raise with, with, with trusts. Um, occupational health will be key to making the assessment around when people are fit for work alongside their GP, obviously. Um, and, and there are opportunities for redeployment um, phased returns and other things that will all need to be considered uh, when a person is coming back to work. Okay, thanks very much. Okay, and going then to Jonathan Buckley. Go ahead, Jonathan. Okay, thank you, Chair. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I can hear you, Jonathan. Go ahead. Thank you very much, Charlotte and um, Heather, for your presentation. And we really do appreciate the work that all of our nursing professionals have done throughout this very difficult time. I suppose. Probably firstly, and a point was mentioned earlier, I am quite alarmed in relation to the rollout of the CARE partner. This was a scheme that was widely uh, recommended and indeed supported and welcomed from the community in relation to the impact that COVID-19 had had on our CARE homes. CARE partner provided that vital link between the family and the, the patient uh, that had been closed off from the public for so long. Uh, worrying that that's only at one third of care homes, given how long this has actually been rolling out. Can you maybe elaborate on ways in which the department can further, uh, you know, assist in, to the care home settings to ensure that this is rolled out quicker? Because it, it is, I think, scandalous that here we are uh, uh, coming into March with still only a third of the care partner provision rolled out across Northern Ireland. So that's the first point. 
Secondly, I suppose probably the failure to workforce plan has been the overriding message from COVID-19. I suppose this, isn't, this is not the time to appropriate blame, but instead to time to refo refocus solutions and, and better pursue outcomes for our health service. So with that in mind, the Northern Ireland Audit Office report on workforce planning for nurses and midwives reported last July, it indicated that substantial numbers could retire over the next 10 years and a need to address staff recruitment and retention issues. How advanced are plans to implement the findings of this report and to what extent has this work been limited by COVID and lack of executive funding? Okay, um, in terms of current partners, then I said, um, I think it's roughly around a third, so that's not an exact figure. Um, and it is increasing over time. Um, like uh, committee members, uh, I'm equally concerned about the number of homes that have, inst have instigated the care partner model. We believe that it is a safe and effective way to uh, reunite families and that all care homes have the ability to, to do so. Um, we continue to work with the care home sector very closely, supporting them at all opportunities, are, as are the, the public health agency and um, our QIA to, to continue to develop this model. We've certainly uh, had Zoom calls with all of the homes sharing good practice, having a discussion about how it can be done safely. Um, extra support has been provided from the department financial support to assist with this. Testing has been made available now to care partners and obviously the vaccine uh, programme has been made available to, to carers. Um, so, so it would seem to me that everything is in place for the care homes now to uh, progress the care partner role very, very quickly. Um, we we maintain regular contact with them. We're in regular contact with families through the, the, the PCC. And indeed, the chief social worker and myself met with families very recently to discuss many of, of, of these issues. We will continue to work with the care home sector and provide as much support as we can to make sure that they bring forward the care partner um, approach. Um, interestingly, I think that um, in speaking with policy colleagues in the other uh, the other countries, um, we have been, I suppose, more ahead of, of, of in our thinking about the care partner model, and now um, others are looking to us as an example of a way forward. And I note particularly in England that uh, care home residents will now have a, a weekly visit, which is very much uh, aligned to the, the ethos behind the, the, the care partner role. Charlotte, the, the sad thing is on that is that, and, and I, I note how slow it is being taken to roll out. Like one third, you know, by the time that we get to 100% of care homes rolling this out, we hopefully will be well beyond uh, COVID and indeed vaccinations of our care homes. Obviously, that's already happened. Sadly, loved ones have lost uh, their 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 friends, their family during a time in which they haven't been able to avail of care partner so it's very distressing to them and i would just urge upon the department to put pressure now and uh, try to focus attention on getting that scheme rolled out asap all right and jonathan i would want to assure you that we are continuing to do that and uh, you know i as i say we, i'm meeting regularly with families and i understand completely uh, how awful it is for, for for those families and how distressed many of them are and we are doing our absolute best to uh, support the, the care homes. And I, like you, see no reason why they cannot introduce care partners more quickly. Um, as the number of, of uh, as the R value decreases in, in communities and as we suppress the virus um, with, with caution, because uh, that doesn't mean that we can just return to normal and return to care home visiting is not something that's going to happen quickly. It has to be in a controlled and planned way with the use of appropriate PPE and the use of testing to guide it, and the implementation of a COVID secure environment. So all of those things still need to be considered, and that, that is an extra requirement on care homes. However, um, in the interest of the population that they serve and their residents, um, I would also urge them to bring forward care partner roles very, very quickly. Okay, and in relation to the second part and workforce? The workforce plan, and um, there is a nursing and midwifery workforce plan in place and has been so uh, for quite some years now, which is regularly reviewed. Um, workforce planning in the department uh, is also um, a work stream under our transformation agenda. 
uh, you did ask whether this has been impacted by COVID, and obviously the answer to that is yes, um, as all resources in the department have been diverted to manage the, the pandemic, uh, including our colleagues' uh, significant uh, amount of work from a, a workforce policy directed point of view. Um, so that, that, that has been um, delayed uh, in terms of taking that forward, but it is very much a priority still for the Minister and the Department. Um, and um, as we can move forward with that, we, we will. I also said that I had commissioned some modelling. Um, as you say, the audit report did say there are a number, a high level of, of uh, nurses and midwives who can retire um, over the next few years. And while it's never going to be an exact science, I think um, the modelling uh, that I've commissioned will be helpful in, in providing a further analysis to that. Okay, and in relation to that data and modelling, so is that how trends of staff retention and recruitment are being monitored purely through that data modelling? And no. would you feel that this oversight is strong enough to identify skills gap in a rounded fashion? So the modelling is a very, very new approach, uh, Jonathan. We haven't actually done it before. And what we're taking here is the learning from COVID because the modellers have provided very good modelling information for, for COVID. Um, we're, we're trying to replicate that now for the for the workforce. So this is a, this is a new departure. If you like, um, the department monitor workforce statistics um, on a regular basis. In fact, there was a new set of, set of statistics re released this week on, on a quarterly basis. Trusts also have very good access to their, their statistics uh, through their workforce um, data set. And we do keep a very close eye on it at all levels, both I, I produce a, a report to the Central Nursing and Midwifery, Midwifery Advisory Committee, which meets once a quarter. Uh, it's a standing agenda item. Um, I speak regularly to the directors of nursing and obviously internally here to the department. These uh, workforce statistics statistics are what are one of the key um, tools that we use to uh, to influence um, our recommendations to the minister in relation to undergraduate uh, training programs across all professions. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan, and thanks, Charlotte. And going now to Alan Chambers. Go ahead, Alan, please. Uh, Charlotte, uh, in your presentation, you alluded to uh, the recruitment of international nurses. Uh, I think we've 658 recruited since 2016. Uh, and I note that the retention rate of, of these nurses is quite high. It's over 90%. Um, you mentioned uh, also about our, our military colleagues, um, and uh, we certainly we thank them for their efforts over uh, the last number of weeks. And, and you said that because of their their high skills, uh, they were able to hit the ground running. Um, is that the case as well with our uh, international nurses that, uh, that we bring in? Are they able to hit the ground running? or do they require uh, a period of orientation or, or probationary uh, supervision uh, and so forth? Um, and also, um, in terms of the fact we're probably saving an awful lot of money when we bring these highly trained professionals in, we save money obviously in having to actually train them. Um, are we able to help them with uh, relocation costs uh, in coming to Northern Ireland? And, and certainly, I, I would place on record, and I, I'm delighted to welcome these uh, professionals uh, for the skills they bring, but also for the, the, the diversity that, that they add to society. And just in terms of, you may not be able to answer this, Charlotte, this may not be your department, but in terms of the recruitment campaign, I assume it's ongoing. Um, and I'm wondering, how is it conducted? Is it the media adverts in various countries, or do we appoint agents to uh, recruit in, in various countries? Thank you. And um, thank you for your question, Alan. And um, Heather uh, Finley, in her role as uh, nursing uh, lead for workforce, um, is very intimately involved in the overseas recruitment campaigns. So I'm going to ask Heather to, to answer some of, of those questions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, Go, thanks, ahead. Charlotte. Um, and thanks, Alan, for the, those questions. Um, and all, all certainly very valid. First of all, in the first point of supervision for uh, international nurses, um, obviously they're new coming into our country, and uh, they absolutely do require a period of induction and support and getting used to our our health systems and our services. Um, when they do come in 
we are um, bound by the Nursing and Midwifery Council um, regulations that they have to meet so that international nurses coming in and the majority of ours will be coming in from the Philippines and India um, are required to register with the Nursing and Midwifery Council and they have to undertake an OSCE exam. That's the Objective Structured Clinical Examination. So they immediately start when they come in um, really well supported by the trusts um, and our clinical education centre. They undertake an um, uh, OSCE programme um, and then it's very intensive, um, run over a, a few days, quite short, and then they will take their OSCE exam. Once they pass that, and here in Northern Ireland, we do have unparalleled um, rate of 100% pass rate for all international nurses thus far coming in, um, which, is not, which is not like the rest of the UK. But when they do that, they then register with the NMC, and that takes a short period of time. They work as senior nursing assistants during that time. So that is all part of their supervision and their induction and getting used, used to our systems. Um, the trusts do provide um, some relocation costs. Um, initially, when they come in, their accommodation is provided by the trusts. and uh, Also, a lot of pastoral support, recognizing the cultural and language differences, etc. cetera. Um, so it has been very successful thus far. And we do welcome our international nurses in um, adding diversity to the workforce and we get very positive feedback about them. Um, the, the system that there's currently in place, it is um, recruitment agencies that have been appointed through a regional contract. And uh, those regional agencies are absolutely vital in ensuring that all recruitment processes are robust and that there's good governance and that they're brought safely to Northern Ireland um, and go through all the different stages such as home office and visa. They, they do all of that. Um, and going forward, you asked what was happening. Well, going forward, um, Charlotte has mentioned the workforce modelling that's been done. Um, as, as a department, we feel there's still potentially a need for further international recruitment. However, um, there's no numbers yet attached to that. A business case has been drawn up um, and it will be a wider framework looking at international recruitment, not just for nursing, but for other professions as well. But we will be weighing up the balances of our increased investment in pre-registration training and education and looking at actually what we need. It's not an exact science, but um, all of the data and modeling and analysis will assist us to do that. Thank you very much. Very reassuring. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. And I'm going then to Kara Hunter. Go ahead, please, Kara. Thank you, Chair, and thank you both, Charlotte and Heather, um, for being here today. A conflict of interest. I'm the daughter of a nurse, um, so I'm well aware of the, you know, the immense pressures, and they're kind of overworked and underpaid, and they should be entirely recognised for their contributions throughout this pandemic. Um, a number of members have touched on some of my points, but I'd just like to touch briefly on um, agency staff. And um, we know that they've been utilised to help deal with um, the shortage of, shortage of nurses, uh, and we know it's been expensive and really can't be sustained. Can you outline any other alternatives um, being reviewed to replace agency staff at this time? And do we have numbers around the costs and the total amount of agency utilised this year? Uh, Cara, th thanks for that. So um, there will always be a need in our system for some uh, flexible and temporary uh, working, either agency or bank, um, for a variety of, of reasons. And our agency nurses provide a very vital support to uh, the permanent workforce. But it is essential uh, for the department and the system to stabilise the workforce and ensure that we have the right number of, of nurses and midwives uh, working uh, on a permanent uh, contract to provide that stability. Work had commenced uh, in association with our trade union colleagues around how we would reduce the number of agency staff in our system and how we would promote um, the use of bank uh, nursing and other professions um, because those staff would be um, staff already working in the trust. They would be familiar with the environment and uh, would provide a more uh, stabilizing effect. Um, and to make the shift from, from agency to uh, incentivising the bank in order to A, provide better quality of care and B, to reduce uh, the, the very uh, expensive cost of, of agency uh, workers in our system. That work, like many other things, has had to be paused uh, because of, of the COVID pandemic. 
but I have no doubt as time allows that will be uh, recommenced uh, and taken forward um, by uh, Workforce Policy Director, the HSC and, and uh, trade unions um, in conjunction. I think it's in everybody's interest to ensure that we have um, a more robust and stabilised uh, flexible workforce who can provide uh, safe and good quality care. Um, I don't have the information in front of me about the use of, of, of agency spend. And, and I guess um, this year that we've been in, um, in some ways is, is so out of kilter with, with the other years that it's, mm-hmm. it's, it wouldn't be fair to even compare um, the, 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 the use and spend on agency nurses to, to previous years. Um, we all accept that it's far too high. And we all accept there is a need to reduce it and uh, provide a more sustainable workforce going forward. Thank you, Charlotte. And then just two smaller questions. Um, just around, uh, you've touched on it earlier uh, around recruitment and retaining nurses. I'm just curious uh, for people who have recently moved to Northern Ireland um, who have a medical background, what steps are being taken to identify them? Uh, and also, uh, another question is around do you see, well, foresee, I suppose. Um, uh, may perhaps a change in students coming into uh, nursing, uh, just after they've witnessed over the past year how nurses have been treated. Um, do you foresee that maybe a lack of students w- will take the step to to get into um, nursing and uh, health and social care jobs and courses? So, um, Cara, in reverse order, um, if that's okay. Um, interestingly, all countries in the UK have seen a dramatic rise in the number of people applying for nursing this year. It's through UCAS. Um, so that's very reassuring, actually, that, um, as you say, uh, people have seen um, what the health service has responded to and the care that has been provided for the population. And uh, it, it, the respect for, for those professions is now being identified in the number of people who wish to pursue a career uh, in that field. I think it's important that we continue to support those potential mm. uh, applicants going forward with all of the information and support that we, that we can. And as I said earlier, we currently have between eight to ten applicants for every undergraduate place um, in, in our system, which is unique actually across um, the UK. Um, and uh, I'm not sure I'm not sure if it's quite as high in, in the Republic of Ireland either. Um, uh, so, so that's really something to hold on to to, to going forward. Um, and then your your other question, I'm sorry, was in relation to. The other question asking, to, sorry, if you don't mind the uh, Just identifying um, yeah. as people who have recently come in to living in Northern Ireland, perhaps yeah. they have a medical background, and just identifying how to access them to, to recruit them. Yeah, yeah. so, so uh, people who come to Northern Ireland can apply um, through HSC Recruit to, to all of our, all our jobs are advertised on HSC Recruit in the normal way. Um, and assuming that they want to work in, in that kind of a role, they, they are free to, to, to do so. Obviously, there will be um, some limitations on people coming into this country from others that need to be met mm-hmm. um, by those individuals. I think it was Jerry asked the question earlier about asylum seekers, and I think there is a piece of work to be done there for those who come from medical uh, and healthcare professional backgrounds who don't have access to provide evidence because of the circumstances that they were in. And that's something uh, certainly um, I, I will I will uh, take forward from a nursing perspective with with trust and, and and indeed talk to my colleagues in workforce policy director to see if there's any more that we can do in that space. That's great, Charlotte. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Charlotte. Charlotte, just a couple of things that I want to pick up on there briefly as well. Uh, in preparation for this session, we had asked for and we did receive a very, very useful uh, update from Nick Ictu around issues that they had identified, and many of those issues have been covered throughout the meeting. However, there's one that touches upon an issue that came up towards the end there in relation to, um, well, firstly in relation to Brexit, the dual registration issue in nursing and midwifery and uh, the, the, Nick Ictu are identifying that there are unresolved matters which are now becoming urgent and they don't feel they've been included in discussions on the resolutions of those issues, either as representative trade unions or, or staff bodies or professional bodies. And I, I'd like, I suppose, a comment on that. But the other thing is, in relation to nurses potentially coming from the South, the, uh, the, interna- the Critical Cure Memorandum of Understanding states that all staff under Section 3.7, all staff involved in cross-jurisdictional patient transfer will continue to adhere 
to their relevant professional standards and registration requirements. So can you give us an update on, on how the system of cross-border working is being facilitated and are nurses now registered on the NMC or, or how, does that, how, does that, uh, how does that work through the system? Um, thanks, Colm. So that's a very live um, discussion that's happening at, at the moment. And uh, we are aware of a number of services that provide uh, cross-border arrangements, um, paediatric cardiology uh, being one, maternity being, being another. So um, dialogue is um, ongoing between the two jurisdictions in relation to dual registration of, of nurses, um, doctors, paramedics and, and all other staff who, who have to meet that requirement. Um, the process has begun, staff have. Um, so in relation to Negatu's comments, um, it's simply a straightforward issue of registering with, in both countries. Um, for both sets of staff, and that process has been has begun. There is a period of time, <coughs> excuse me, required to produce the evidence that's needed to to, to meet the registration requirements. And uh, and again, that, that that's something that we're we're working on. So it's very much work in progress. And we have until the end of March to have those registrations completed. And um, for those staff who cannot meet those timeframes dialogue is ongoing between the regulators to see if we can put a, a, a mechanism in place to ensure that the service continues. Okay, thank you. And, and can you give us any indication as to the current level of uh, communication between yourself and the unions and the representative bodies in that in relation um, to that? I personally haven't had any correspondence with them. Um, I know there is a, a, a regular um, engagement session from Workforce Policy Director, and I know that Workforce Policy are taking a very uh, strong lead in this, so I, I I, would suggest there has been discussion through that forum, although I can't, can't at this point confirm it. Okay. Okay, thank you. And just again, to picking up on one other issue that was raised, I think it was by Arlea, in relation to the private sector and the, the very urgent need to deal with some of the backlogs that we have and to reinstate the, the, the those life-threatening surgeries that, that are dealing with life-threatening conditions. Um, and you had said that, uh, that the private sector was a key partner, but it would take a large amount of money. And I'm just wondering, in the context of the, that there was £90 million pounds returned, um, is there further scope that can be uh, leveraged from the private sector to both provide some of the backlog in surgeries and also to assist with the respite for staff? Um, the, the Health and Social Care Board have been intimately involved um, and have been reporting directly to the Minister. He's taken a very, as you would imagine, um, keen interest in, in how we would move forward with this. And it's, as I said, a key priority for him. All options, as I understand it, have been explored, Chair, in that regard. And, and every opportunity within the independent sector to provide extra capacity has been identified and utilised um, as, best, as best it can be at this stage. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Listen, thank you very much. And, and I appreciate that you have stayed quite a, quite a period of time and taken, taken a, a large range of questions from members, Charlotte and Heather. And I really do appreciate your, your time in that respect. I also do want to, to uh, reiterate um, our appreciation for what frontline nursing, and I know you have also mentioned other allied health professionals who are all providing a part of the solution and carrying some of the burden of this pandemic. Um, and in recent weeks, I have had personal experience of, of uh, losing a family member, my father-in-law, as a result of COVID. And uh, the family will forever be grateful for what was done for them, um, above and beyond anything that, that, that you should expect. And, and just the care, the compassion, the commitment of the entire staff is absolutely remarkable. So I want to thank you for appearing today and I want to, I'd like to ask you to pass on our thanks as a committee to every each and every one of your frontline staff and uh, that we will certainly do all we can to play a role in terms of supporting them in the time ahead, learning the lessons and seeing how we can do things better and how we can build a properly resourced and funded and staffed uh, workforce for the time ahead. So thank you very much, Charlotte and Heather Gormayagov and Islam. Foil. Thanks very much. Okay, bye. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> okay, members, um, I think we should.
Judge, we're going ahead to consider a number of ASRs. Um, I think we should take another maybe short break in advance of that. So I propose um, 12.36 now. We could take take about a 15-minute break. Um, so come back, say, 12.55, please. Yeah, so back for 12.55. Thank you, members. Sure, that's us live now. Okay, thank you. So, members, um, uh, we're going to resume. We're back now in public session, resuming now. The next two items on the agenda are ASRs relating to coronavirus international travel restrictions. A departmental official is here to brief the committee on the provisions of these regulations and to take any questions that members may have. Can I refer members there to the papers at tab 7 to 8 of your pack, which includes a clerk's memo on the ASRs at tab 7.1. Uh, I'd also like to draw members' attention to the departmental response to issues raised at the last committee briefing on travel restrictions, which is a tab 12.5 of your pack there. So I'd now like to welcome to the to committee Ms. Elaine Colgan, and Elaine is Chief of Staff to the Chief Medical Officer. Good afternoon, Elaine. Good afternoon, Just checking if you can hear us okay, Elaine. Yeah. 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 You okay? We're here. We're here. We're hearing you loud and loud and clear there, Elaine. So, thank you for coming along, Elaine. And please go ahead and, and give us your briefing. Okay. Um. Can I just check if Gillian Hines is on the line? I can't see from my screen if she's with us. Yeah. There she is now. Yeah. So, um. Good afternoon, oh. uh, Chair and members. But and thank you for the opportunity to brief the committee. Uh, Gillian's actually going to outline the changes from the both sets of the regulations under discussion today and afterwards if there are any further questions I'm happy to take those. Uh, we're not hearing you there Gillian. Gillian I, um, I just want to check I just want to check Clark are you hearing Gillian? No there was no audio coming through Gillian. So, Gillian, we don't have audio from you there. If you can just check, if you have a headset, that usually is is better. Uh, check mute, obviously, and um, but we're not hearing you. Uh, we we can see you clearly enough, but we're not hearing you at this point. So, um, we'll try that again, please. So, I'll go back to you now, Gillian, to check if we're hearing from you now. No. No, we're, okay, we're, we're um, not hearing sure. anything. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll yes, just do the briefing, um, Chair. That's okay. Um, so the first, okay, the first regulation you. is the Health Protection um, Amendment uh, SR17 for 2021. Uh, these regulations amend the, the travel advice um, regulations that apply to operators of commercial transport services that are coming from outside the common travel area to Northern Ireland. And they are required to provide information to passengers about the requirement to possess notification of a negative coronavirus test result. Uh, the, those regulations also made amendments to the general international travel regulations. And it did a number of things. It reduced the amount of information a pass that the passenger locator form collected. So it removed the need for passengers to, uh, to include the name of any organised travel group the name of any emergency contact and their details and whether or not they were completing the form on behalf of another person. The, the regulation also uh, added uh, additional essential public health information for those entering the UK and that would have to be provided. It increased the amount of fixed penalty notice for the failure to complete the passenger locator form up, uh, with the first level being now £500 and that was an increase from £60 and the laddering then goes up to 4,000 for multiple offences. It included an exemption for air crew from the requirement to possess a negative coronavirus test result. And it included Burundi, Rwanda and the United Arab Emirates in the list of countries and territories in Schedule 5 that are subject to the additional measures. Finally, these regulations amended the Health Protection Pre-Departure Testing and Operator Liability Regulations which means that operators are not required to ensure that a notification of a negative test result is from a qualifying test, i.e. that the person actually got a test meeting the legislative standard. 
Um, the liability for ensuring the result of the test is from a qualifying test falls to the passenger now rather than the operator, with non-compliance uh, leading to a fixed penalty notice of £500 and upwards. The second amendment under discussion today was SR 2021-32. And these, uh, following a cross-government review of the sectoral exemptions list, these regulations amended the sectoral exemptions uh, and the, how they applied to the self-isolation exemption. So the first change was that the exemption for domestic and international elite sports persons was tightened to remove certain categories of worker from the exemption. Changes include restricting the training abroad provision to those who are Olympic or Paralympic athletes and removing exemptions for new club signings that was really in place for the January transfer window. A technical adjustment was made regarding the medicines, human and veterinary exemption to include a reference to the definition of qualified person and inspector from the veterinary medicines regulations 2013. And the final amendment was that we removed all sporting competitions from the list in Schedule 4. And following um, a review and a consideration, we decided that it was no longer appropriate in Northern Ireland to list the sporting competitions that were taking place in other areas of GB. Uh, and that is partly in line with the tightening of the exemptions generally. So at the moment, there are no sporting competitions in Schedule 4, but we will reinsert those that take place in Northern Ireland when the time comes for those to be required. So that's that's the briefing for the two regulations, and I'm happy to take any questions the committee may have. Okay, well, first of all, in relation to the, uh, the changes on the passenger locator form, I'm just wondering why things like the emergency contact number and name were removed. Is that not a, a fairly crucial piece of information? What was the rationale behind each of those amendments to that? The, the gen generally, what we've been trying to do with the passenger locator form is simplify it. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of questions on it. Uh, and whilst it, with, when you look at Schedule 1, there doesn't seem to be a lot of information required to be completed, uh, it is a, a fairly lengthy form to complete. Uh, so that we, we, we think that that may be affecting compliance, and our aim is to make it as streamlined and as simple as possible for people to complete. And that has meant removing any, any questions that we don't think are needed. So in terms of the emergency contact specifically, uh, the, the person will still be providing their own contact information and telephone numbers. Um, so that will include an address uh, in the UK and for the most part. So there will still be ways of, of finding out who that person is and tracking that back to how they've come. So we would be able to get in touch with people uh, and emergency contact if needed by other means. Okay, thank you. And can I ask why you're why you're, you're proposing to remove to remove the review mechanism? Surely, with all of this being kind of so new and and uh, dynamic, surely the review mechanism is a key factor. So, what we have done with the review mechanism is in the main regulations, the review mechanism is required at least once every I think it's twenty eight days. But it, there's a provision that if the regulations are amended, that that in itself is considered a review. And what we've done is aligned all of the smaller sets of regulations with that. So it, it recognises that once we amend any any one of those regulations, or, or the main one particularly, that that is effectively a review of the entire policy because it's constantly under review. So we haven't removed the provision as such. What we've done is tied the revision of each of the individual sets of regulations through the one review, which is of the principal regulations. Okay. And then um, finally, from me, before I go on to members, some members' questions. Um, uh, how many, what's the data around the number of arrivals and what sort of cost is involved in the monitoring system? What are, what are the departments spending on the on the monitoring of the, P, the PHLFs and the uh, how much data is being gleaned? Like, for example, for example, can you can you at any given time say how many arrivals have been from a particular country? And I'm I'm asking this particular in light of the news this week and the, the worrying news around the South African variant. Um, so, do you have that type of detail? And what is being spent on on maintaining this system? Okay. Um. So first of all, on the data itself, we're actually improving the situation quite well over the last couple of weeks. Um. So. 
what what the change that has taken place is that Public Health England are now following up at all arrivals coming into England and Northern Ireland rather than just a sample. Uh, so that has meant that we're getting richer data because we're able to see um, the data every day on the number of people that come to Northern Ireland that are being called. In terms of the countries that they come from, uh, we have improved that situation as well. And there is a breakdown that is now um, able to be reported on of the countries that the people come from. Um, in terms of the total arrivals, we're getting roughly in and around 200 per week coming through the UK at the moment. Uh, the other side of the data is the arrivals through the Republic of Ireland, which we've also made good progress on in the last few weeks. We have now introduced the interim solution um, pending uh, getting a full information sharing agreement with Ireland. And text messages are being issued to all arrivals into Ireland that indicate that they're coming on to Northern Ireland. And um, I'm just looking at the figures and between the 15th and the 22nd of February, so for one week, we had about 1,300 texts issued to people coming through the south to Northern Ireland. So we are getting a much richer picture of our data and we're looking at how we could present that uh, at best um, and we're exploring whether or not it would be possible to present that uh, in some sort of public format uh, that would be able to be reviewed as well. In terms of the cost, of following up with those in the public or those arrivals. We don't pay for the follow up for any of the, the ones coming through the UK. And um, that is entirely funded through Public Health England because our numbers are actually really quite small in comparison to the numbers of arrivals through England that are being dealt with uh, under the same process. Uh, we do pay for the text messages that are issued from the South. Uh, and we had an indicative cost of that, and I would have to get the exact figures for committee, um, but there was a developmental cost of the system for the contractor, and then there's an ongoing cost of text messages, but we can get you those, um, I, I don't want to guess the figures in case I get them wrong, but we can get you those figures um, quite quickly. Okay, and oh, could you yeah. also give us a breakdown of the data from travel from particular countries, and, and can you get us that breakdown as well? Um, I'm not sure at the moment. The difficulty at the moment is the numbers. So our numbers are actually quite low, which is why we're not able to, at this point, publish it. Publish it. Um, but once we get the picture for a few more weeks, we should be able to have kind of a more, a bigger numbers and bigger picture. So we, it would, at the moment, it's bordering on identifiable information because the numbers are quite low for, for each country. Um, but we are looking uh, as we go on and get more data and build up the data picture that we would be able to provide um, more information on that. Okay, thank you, Elaine. I'm going to go then to members. So I'm going first of all to Jerry Carroll. Go ahead, Jerry. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Elaine. Uh, just two quick questions, Elaine. Uh, any development or progress on the sharing of the passenger locator forms information with the South? There's obviously been a lot of um, delay in, in progress in, in that. Any any advancements of that? And also, do we have any um, assessment of the level of quarantining? Uh, from people maybe from UAE in particular. Um, I presume there's not a lot of flights uh, from Burundi to England or Scotland and then people traveling from there to, uh, into the north, but I presume there's a, quite a high amount of travel um, from UAE. Uh, so do I have an assessment of the level of quarantining uh, from people who have came from there? Thanks. Um, thanks, Jerry. So on the first point around the information sharing with ROI, we have made really good progress in the last couple of weeks. Um, it, we've just, we've decided that the information would be shared with public health agency in the, in Northern Ireland rather than directly with the department, and so the and a draft MOU is in advanced stage with between public health agency and with the Department of Health in Ireland to share that information. Uh, so that will cover um, the contact tracing elements and any contact that's needed um, from a public health perspective, and we're exploring options around how those passengers are then followed up from a compliance checking perspective. On the level of quarantine, uh, at the moment, um, because we've no direct international flights from any of the red countries into Northern Ireland, anyone coming to Northern Ireland through the UK would have to enter managed quarantine in England under their English regulations. So we don't have any indication, and it's very difficult really to, to get an indication of how many of those passengers had intended to come over to Northern Ireland uh, because they're no longer required to provide that information because they'll be spending the full quarantine period in the English jurisdiction. Um, so we, we, it probably will be quite difficult for us in the interim period 
before we would have any managed quarantine here to get a handle on that. Um, and we are exploring... Uh, sorry, go on ahead. Sorry, uh, could we get that information in terms of the number of people who are quarantining in, in England or, or the UK, uh, but who are uh, coming into uh, the North uh, thereafter? That, that's the difficulty, Jerry. We actually won't be able to get it um, because we won't. We those passengers aren't required to tell us where they intend to go when they leave self isolation in England. So the passenger locator form will only require them to give the information for the ten days of their quarantine period. And because they're in managed quarantine, they'll be going to a quarantine hotel in England. So it will be def it, it, practically impossible for us to know how many of them intend once they leave managed isolation to come over to Northern Ireland. Okay, thanks. I think we need to explore that further, but uh, thanks for your, your answers there, Lillian. No worries. Thank you. And I'm going then to Pam. Cameron, go ahead, Pam. Thank you, Chair. And thank you, Liam, again, for your presence. Um, the, the Chair had asked you around data, um, and I would like to see some of that data as well, and see how um, arrival volumes have been impacted by the regulations. So I'm assuming you don't have that information, but maybe if you could just include it with the, the other information that the Chair had asked for. And I'd also want to ask you how many fixed penalty notices have been issued under the framework and how do the scale of these and their use to date compare with other regions of the UK? Okay. Um, the the um, the data on arrivals and the numbers, uh, whether it's been impacted, we we're still getting around the same levels of people indicating that they're coming to Northern Ireland generally on the passenger locator form, which is in around 180 to 200 a week. Uh, so. The information that we're getting coming through, there was an interim period where the public health agency was doing some follow up with those arrivals for red countries. This was before managed quarantine was introduced and the numbers were, were actually quite low. So there were under 20 per week. Uh, so from, from that, we don't expect the numbers to into Northern Ireland really to be drastically affected by managed quarantine at this point. Um, but we will keep an eye on that as the data um, comes through in the next few weeks. Um, fixed penalty notices, in terms of the fixed penalty notices for the passenger locator form, uh, because we've no direct arrivals into Northern Ireland, there won't be any issued for those in the Northern Irish jurisdiction itself at any of our airports. And we try to get the data from Border Force to see if they were able to tell us about how many of those that were issued in England were for transiting passengers. And they indicated that they were unable to disintegrate that data, so we wouldn't be able to find out. Uh, so we have tried to get that, but unfortunately, we're just not able to get it, to get that information at this point. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm going then to Arlea Flynn. Go ahead, Arlea, please. Thanks, Colin. Um, Elaine, so just on the, the, the issue with the passenger locator forms, so that update that you've gave us today around, so there's around 200 um, per week coming into the north from, from Britain. Are they being picked up by, um, at the last briefing you were talking about, you had spoke to the department um, for transport around inserting that additional section into the passenger locator forms where someone... Um, so the... We explored the option. I think the difficulty that we had been trying to address with Department for Transport was around getting a handle on the number of compliance checks that were taking place with people coming in to the north. So we actually did manage to solve that, but it was literally on the same day that then indicated that they were now going to follow up with all arrivals. Um, so whilst we have solved it, should we ever go back to a sampling approach again, um, it's no longer needed <laughs> anymore because they are sampling everything. Um, and we were always able to get a report on the total number of arrivals coming in. It was it, the difficulty was the sample number and um, so a solution on two fronts at once <laughs> yes no that that's great to hear elaine i'm really really pleased to hear that and um as the progress as well <clears throat> um north and south um that's that's also welcome around the the text message and stuff and and the mou that you are working on um around the the data share but just on that as well so with the the memorandum of understanding that's that's obviously being compiled at the moment um is is that both ways so you know remember last time you were saying that um 
the officials in the south um, had to, they had asked informally if we could share data north to south, but they had to come back with a formal request. So is that going to be part of the MOU? Um, no, that the the South are now actively pursuing an MOU with the Home Office. Is my understanding for the UK data for, on those that are going to Ireland from the UK? Okay, so they're pursuing that formal that formal option. Yep. That's good to know. And then just finally, um, Elaine, see um, the list of rare countries um, in this SR um, and the additional measures. Are any of those matching up uh, with the Dublin list? Do you know? Um, yeah, have, so the Irish list, uh, yeah, so Ireland has proposed 20 countries on their red list, um, and we have at the moment 33 on our red list in the UK. Uh, so there is some divergence at this point, and our red countries are under review, um, and I think there might be some changes to that in the next couple of weeks, depending on the, the data that's coming through on variants. Um, so once Ireland is able to introduce um, I think they've only introduced the primary legislation around managed isolation at this point, and they're following up with regulations thereafter. So once we get that to that point, uh, we will look more definitively at the difference between the two lists and then work out what, if any, action needs to be taken on that basis. Okay, Elian, thanks very much. Thank you. And finally, Carol Nichol, and go ahead, Carol, please. Um, thank you. So. One of the questions I want to ask really is around um, under fraud, the Fraud Act in relation to these. So the question I have is, does it create an offence of fraud for either false representation by failing to disclose information um, on completion of the passenger locator form? And it said it could result in imprisonment and or a fine. Could you give me some details on that, please? Um, I would have to come back to you on that one, to be honest. I think it might be in a, a later amendment, um, but in, in any case, I haven't got that information to hand. I know that the Fraud Act was a UK-wide piece of legislation that we had to um, determine how it impacted here, so I can come back to committee with, with more detail on that one. And we, we still haven't got the data on all that either. You said earlier, is that covered? does this cover in this either? Or which, as well? which data? Which data, sorry? So is it the data in terms of, you know, the number of people? Well, first of all, just let me ask you this and it might make more sense. There seems to be an awful lot of work involving these ASRs for very little traffic of international flights coming here. So you said it could be, if I picked you up right around 200. So could we get the, the exact data on that, um, please? Yeah. Um, so that yes, the the data at the moment we get a, a a list every week on the numbers that come in each day. So it is fluctuating, um, and I was using kind of two hundred as an approximation because sometimes it's slightly over and sometimes it's slightly under each week. And um, we would like to get to the point where we can publish that, and we're working with our stats team at the moment to do that, uh, in the hope that we'll be able to, to publish some regular reporting. But there are no inter international flights coming into the north. Is that right? That's correct. The, we don't anticipate any direct international flights until um, mid to end March. Okay, so so on the basis that there's no international flights here, but there is in Dublin, um, and if people are coming here, then they're quarantined in Dublin or they're quarantined here? At the moment, there there's no requirement for them to stay in the south for their quarantine. They, they come straight here. So the fact that we have the land border is the primary reason why we have introduced the requirement and, and worded it the way that we have. So it, it doesn't matter how you come to Northern Ireland, whether that's by land or by air or by sea, you still have the same self-isolation requirements and still have the same requirements to complete the forms as if um, if you have been in, in abroad within the previous, um, the previous period and then you self-isolate for 10 days. And do we have the data for that? So we know there's 200 flights. Do we know how many people are quarantined here? Well, those um, 200 per week are people who are quarantining in Northern Ireland and have come through the UK. And then the, the data that I mentioned for the South, um, which was 1,300 between 15th and 22nd of February, that, that's the start of the data that we'll be getting through every week from Ireland. So that was the ones that indicated when they arrived in the South. 
on their Irish passenger locator form that they were travelling onwards to Northern Ireland. And is there much difference between the, the passenger locator form that they're using in Dublin compared to one that they'll be using here, given that the number, the level of information on the passenger locator forms has been reduced? Um, the the South form was always shorter than ours, uh, so there was always less information on that and less information on the travel history than what would be collected on the UK form. It is just important to mention, though, that even if they travel through the South and complete an Irish passenger locator form, and even if we have access to that information, the legal requirement will still exist to complete a UK passenger locator form. Um, and that requirement is the one that we will be able to take action and compliance on, um, not the fact that they have, have had to complete an Irish form or anything like that. No, I understand that. I mean, like in essence, in principle, some people who are traveling could fill in four or five locator forms depending on where they're coming from. Um, but the yeah. issue here that I mean as early as raised, the, the information that's been asked on the passenger locator form here has reduced, albeit you're saying it's going to be reviewed. So um but I would I would, you know, ask that you send to us in writing that information about um amendment number seven, possible imprisonment and fine, because I think it's really important. We need to know is it yeah. one or what, what I, it is? I think I'm up in about two weeks' time to brief the committee on amendment number seven, so we I can I can address that that, that briefing if if that's of assistance. Yeah, no bother. Thank you. Okay. okay, Carol, thank you. And and just just on that amendment number seven, um Elaine, I would note that that's already in place and operating, and um, I take it that you're you're key, you're involved in the drafting and aware of the drafting. So, just on the on the basic simple question of was the issue of the impact of including fraud there considered in terms of how that might impact people and up to potential imprisonment? Did you consider um, that as part of your drafting? Um, yes, we did consider it. I just don't have the information um, and. and to be honest, it's difficult to keep it all in my head, I confess. Um, but yes, it was considered, uh, and we can give you more information on that, um, either at the next briefing or in writing before that, if you prefer. Um, in writing, please, Elian, have preferred writing, please, because that's obviously a significant escalation there and something that we that we want to be taking a taking a good a good look at. Yeah, no problem. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Elaine. I don't have any other members indicating there, so I think we can let yourself and Gillian go. Gillian, um, we didn't get to hear from you, but thank you for appearing and thank you, Elaine, for coming along. Thank no you. No problem. Thank okay. you, Chair. Bye. Okay. Thank you. And members, just just I, I need to point out, members, that we will lose the broadcasting facility at one thirty. So um, we uh, I need to bear that in mind. Um, so. If there's, I'm going to, I'm going to move to each of the other, each of the, uh, each of those individually now to, uh, to formally consider them. So, and there will be an opportunity for members to raise any other issues they might have, um, at that point. So, firstly, SR two thousand and twenty one forward slash seventeen. I refer members to tab seven of your pack. And can I remind members that this SR places certain obligations of operators of commercial transport regarding the requirement for a negative coronavirus test. Increases penalty notices for non-completion of passenger locator forms, and adds to the list of countries subject to additional measures. The examiner of statutory rules has reported that this SR was led in breach of the 21-day rule, but that she is content for the department's reason for the breach. Have members any further issues you wish to raise in connection with that statutory rule? Um, Chair, would, would it be appropriate even just to ask, are they doing like a? Uh, SLs on uh, mandatory hotels in relation to this, or where does that come in? So that we that we write and ask them for an update on whether they're doing an SL one on mandatory hotels. Carl, is that your question? Okay, members, content with that? Yeah, thank you. So, if members have no for, further issues, then uh, to wish to raise with that, can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered. The Health Protection, Coronavirus, International Travel, Operator Liability and Public Health Advice, Amendment Regulations 2021, and has no objection to the rule. Are we agreed? Agreed. Thank you, members. Moving on then to SR 2021 forward slash 32, and I refer you, members, there to tab 8 of your pack. Uh, I remind members that this SR makes certain changes to the list of those exempt from self-isolation requirements. 
reported that the SR was led in breach of the 21-day rule, but that she is content for the department's reason for that breach. The ESR report is included at tab 12.24 of the tabled pack. Uh, have members any further issues they wish to raise in connection with the statutory rule? Okay, I, th I think I, yeah, I do have an issue to raise, I think, in relation to this, in that it's clearly an awful lot of cutting and pasting taking place. And at this point, I think it would be fair to ask the department what their plans are to kind of develop our own um, our own strategic view of, of uh, sports and different things like that there and the self-isolation to make them more tailored to our needs. So if members are content, could we write to the department asking them for how they plan to consider specifically the data and how that links to measures we're taking here? Um, members content? Okay, thank you. So then can I also ask, if there's no further issues to raise and I don't see any indications, can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2021 forward slash 32, the Health Protection Coronavirus International Travel Amendment number six regulations uh, 2021 and has no objection to the rule. Are we agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Thank you, members. Members, just very quickly before broadcasting, SR 2126, the Healthy Start Scheme and Daycare Food Scheme Amendment Regulations, the examiner of statutory rules has not reported on those regulations yet and has highlighted that they are currently in discussions with officials in relation to that rule. So could I propose that we defer our consideration of that item to next week's meeting? Agreed. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So I just want to check, Clerk, should we pause there before we go to SL1 and uh, come out of broadcasting or carry on and just uh, carry on as far as possible? What's your... I think we'll, we, we carry on, Chair. I've asked the broadcast the question just that um, they'll continue the meeting just so they will. Okay. Okay. So, members, SL1 there is the Recovery of Health Service Charges Amounts Amendment Regulations 2021. The department here is proposing to make a statutory rule to apply an inflationary uplift to the current tariff levels for the scheme that provides for the collection of costs incurred by hospitals in treating casualties of road traffic accidents. This inflationary uplift regulation comes before the committee on an annual basis. Um, and I do recall actually it's it coming up last year. So it's, it's to do with the inflationary uplift. It's proposed that the regulation comes into operation on 1st of April, 2020. So are members content that the department would make that statutory rule? Content, Chair. Yep. Thank you, members. Okay, members, um, before moving on to correspondence, I just want to clarify, we, uh, we, we did agree earlier that we would defer that legal briefing to next week. And uh, would members be content that all of those items under, 11, under eight, agenda, item 11, that we defer those all to next week? Agreed. Yep. Okay, thank, thank you, members. So moving on then to correspondence, members. Can I draw your attention to a number of items there? I refer, I refer members to two responses from the department in relation to issues raised by the committee further to its consideration of SR 2021 forward slash 8 at tab 12.4 there of your pack and to 12.22 in your table papers. And that's a response from the department in relation to issues which were flagged up during the chairperson's discussions with the Human Rights Commissions. So members will have seen that response. Do members have any comments in relation to that? Okay. Okay, so would members be content that we respond to the department to outline that I don't believe that the response was satisfactory uh, in the extent that they, they said they would, com they would consult with the Human Rights Commission when timescales allowed, I think is, is to quote from it. And I honestly don't think that that is... Um, really good enough in terms of it's yeah. it's not a huge timely piece of work to consult the health the the human rights commission i believe the human rights commission would facilitate a speedy and a swift response given the lack of other consultation and other time for this committee and others to scrutinize i think that's actually not good enough and um, so i would like to to uh, indicate that and to outline that consultation with the human rights commission on regulations relating to mental health patients should be at the forefront of their considerations would members Great. be content Agreed. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, um, I think we just need to, before we go on to the following item of correspondence, we now need to pause. Is that correct, Clerk, to allow broadcasting to? Yes, sure. We just need to pause a wee second. They're going to end the broadcast and then switch us back on to a, a normal um, Starleaf meeting. So, that just takes a wee bit of 
um, okay. working for them. Okay. Yeah. So we'll wait. We'll we'll wait to hear back from you, Clark, that that is being completed. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber 